implications, of course, to the task of trace. As we change our processes, or if there is a change in our processes moving forward, and I think that testing will increase for, for some methods of testing, will increase and then what is the implication for those who are tracing and who are exceptionally busy at the moment? We have to think about the first two hours staff health and care. So we will follow the guidelines, I know that. And I do see the need to have a balance, keeping the sector moving swiftly, but it does feel like a period of change at the moment. Thank you. Fair enough answer. Yeah, Linda. Thank you, Chair. Could I please ask Jill, and could I just um, agree with Avian on the excellent work that staff at the board have been undertaking throughout the pandemic? But could I just ask, given that a number of visitors will be coming to North Wales over the summer, and and anticipated that there will be a higher number than ever. Are there any concerns by Jill about our capacity to be able to look after the visitors in addition uh, to the locals? Um, again, excellent question, Linda, and thank you for posing it. Um, yeah, we are absolutely seeing an increase in visitors across North Wales, and I understand it's topped the charts for the UK, actually, for a staycation destination. Uh, and we are seeing the impact on that on our emergency services. So um, we are routinely seeing um, uh, a significant number of patients in our beds who are not local to North Wales. And indeed, they're also accessing our ED departments and minor injuries units. Um, and the socialisation there brings its own risk in terms of COVID. Uh, and whilst we are, we continue to manage that and we're absolutely uh, doing everything we can um, to support the messaging um, that, that is, is going out to our public. Um, we are really, really conscious of the increase in volume and we're seeing the increase in attendances in our ED departments and our other uh, areas accessing um, care very much increasing. We're still trying to manage the red and green pathways, as I alluded to earlier, and that does put uh, a challenge on our, our departments in terms of the testing as well, so we get the results back so we can separate. So this it very much is putting up an increased pressure on all our services, um, and that would in, include our community services as well, Linda, and it is one that, that we are flagging. Thank you. Okay, I can't see any other hands up. Uh, Jill, a couple of observations, questions from me. So the first is, as you described, the instant rates in North Wales are climbing, uh, particularly now in the east. Uh, we've got the highest instant rates in Wales. Uh, whilst we note the level of hospitalisation that are nowhere near wave one or two, they are still increasing uh, slowly. So how, how concerned are you as a team about that dynamic, Jill? Uh, and what else can we do as a board to communicate any concerns that you have, either with the public or stakeholders? Uh, and in that regard, uh, the uh, First Minister was on Radio 4 this morning, uh, and I thought he was very clear about what the expectations are as to the rules moving forward in Wales. Uh, and particularly around the wearing of face masks. But you will be picking up feedback, I'm sure we are too, and I've certainly seen it this morning in Mould, where people are clearly changing their behaviour and not following the expectations around uh, the wearing of face masks, for example. So how concerned are you in the team, Jill? And is there anything the board can help you uh, reinforce the messages? Um, we are concerned... Uh chair and that's why we're doing um we're looking at our surge plans 
We're looking at the impact that may have on our inpatients. And again, as we've seen previously, it does have impact on other services, including our planned care, which we are desperately trying um, to, to treat those who have been waiting far longer than they should have done as a consequence of our initial long waits, but then compounded uh, by COVID. The point I, I would reinforce, would reinforce the need for vaccination, absolutely support um, the masks and the fact that we will be maintaining that stance within our own buildings um, in order to protect our, our staff and our public and support of the board and that is going to be greatly appreciated. Um, and I think um, in terms of, of um, it, it is about the public messaging, reinforcing the public messaging. I would ask that people don't turn off their um, ping, for want of a better term, that, that people do self-isolate it until that they can prove that they are not impacted if they have been contacted, because we are still uh, seeing a significant risk. That is also compounded, Chair, by the fact that we are anticipating, and we've already had one small outbreak, of other viruses impacting as we go into... Um, the autumn, uh, late summer and autumn months. So we have already seen norovirus. Clearly, we're thinking about how we manage the flu. So we would ask people to, to actually protect themselves, protect their families and protect the health system. And, and whilst it is really, really difficult, everyone is trying to get back to normal and wants to get back to normal, we are still re living with a significant risk. Okay, so in terms of the messaging, Chia, I know there's a lot going out, but can you keep the board appraised of what is going out, please, in terms of uh, the concerns that you've got and how we're seeking to address them? Because, uh, you know, there's, there's clearly some poor behaviour out there. There may be some confusion too. So we've got to do all that we can as a board to, to address that. And are you having these conversations with partners as well, Jill, in the sense of some of these messages might more easily come from some of our partners? Yes. Um, so, so yes, we are. And they have been supporting that. They've been um, supporting the messages about um, behaviours and they've been supporting the messages about vaccines. So, yes, we are. We're working collectively uh, across, um, across the, um, the local authority comms teams as well. We're also sending out um, letters and... and um, information um, to uh, to um, tourist centres so that we're getting the message across to those that aren't normal uh, Welsh residents. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, and then a uh, second question for me, and it might be better for Chris to respond to this. So uh, there's an update on primary care access in the presentation, but one of the biggest concerns that we are uh, receiving a lot of uh, uh, correspondence about uh, and it's coming from staff and from people in our communities is about access to, to GPs in particular uh, and the perception that uh, uh, behaviour has continued in terms of denial of access because of COVID risk and that that should start to be shifting now. What's your uh, position on that, Chris, and in, in terms of where we are now and how we might move forward? Thank you. So all the way through the um, pandemic, we have had uh, processes in place which uh, require people to contact and be triaged before then uh, being uh, provided with face-to-face uh, -face, uh, consultations. And as time has moved on, the threshold for face-to-face -face consultations has uh, appropriately uh, shifted. And all of our GPs um, in North Wales are aware that there's no justification um, in any way um, to deny uh, moving through to a face-to-face -face consultation where it's appropriate. However, often it still is not appropriate and, and, and often it does um, um, uh, present uh, a risk um, to either individuals within, within the practice that then can see a practice having to uh, close uh, due to um, 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 isolation should uh, be delivered and our contractors uh, are trying to do that. It's a difficult message to uh, share sometimes um, uh, and there is this perception that maybe primary care is closed 
In fact, it's far from closed, it's busier than it's ever been. Uh, there is a uh, short uh, video which is currently um, uh, being shared on social media and um, through um, um, through uh, um, media outlets across Wales uh, that has been produced by Welsh Government. We're putting the link for that uh, on our website. It's very helpful. It's only about 20 seconds uh, or so long, just explaining uh, some of the reasonings behind uh, triage and reassuring people that actually a face-to-face -face appointment will follow through if that is what is uh, is required. Chris, given the increase in demand uh, and the pressures being faced, uh, in terms of sustainability of primary care services, uh, what are you doing to examine that? So we continue to uh, expand uh, the offer in primary care um, to beyond uh, the traditional uh, model of a GP and practice nurse. Um, that's not to uh, be dismissive of GPs and practice nurses, but there are many people uh, that can do lots of, uh, of those roles uh, that might previously um, have, have fallen to them. Um, and, uh, and it's right and proper that those um, individuals are available to be consulted with uh, too, uh, and that people are appropriately directed so that they can make uh, the best, uh, best use of, of those different resources. It includes um, high street uh, providers such as optometry and community pharmacy, but it also includes a whole raft of different professionals working within practices. And that means then that um, when you need to see your GP, uh, your GP is focused more upon uh, the things that only they can do uh, and supported by that wider team. We do have uh, recruitment um, programmes uh, in place for um, uh, GPs as well as for all of those uh, other uh, professionals um, uh, and we will uh, continue uh, to move those through. Um, but um, the short answer to your, your, your question is it, it, it is really tough. Uh, 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 GPs uh, and, their, uh, and their staff are being very clear about prioritising the really important work that they uh, need to do uh, and sharing that across that, that, that wider team uh, to, to, to have the greatest impact. So just in terms of key messages then, Chris, so what we're saying is, uh, in short, uh, when one considers the number of face-to-face -face, uh, appointments, the number of calls being received by GP switchboard, add that to e-consult and other virtual mechanisms. Uh, generally, the demand is significantly higher than pre-COVID. So uh, as a consequence of that, we're wishing to keep triage in place uh, to help deal with that demand in the most appropriate manner. But where it's clinically necessary for someone to see a GP, we would expect them to be able to see a GP. Absolutely. Right. Great. Thank you. I think Cheryl wants to come in, Chris, before you okay. stop. Cheryl? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, thanks, Chris. Um, I'd just like to ask, following on from that conversation, um, I speak to a lot of um, our, our residents and patients every day, and I'm finding that particularly amongst the older generation, there's a real, real reluctance to share um, a lot of detail with um, receptionists carrying out um, sort of the initial recording of their symptoms and their concerns and worries. And I'm very concerned that this is going to lead to this knock on, um, you know, serious things not being addressed uh, fully. Um, because of this. Have, have you got any thoughts on that? I, it seems to be a particular generational thing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a really, uh, really helpful um, uh, question because um, uh, you're right that um, uh, many people um, will express concerns that uh, if they give uh, additional information to uh, the receptionist, that the receptionist is going to be doing the triaging. Um, and, um, and, and that's absolutely not the case. Um, it does help um, to uh, divert um, the inquiry uh, through the triage process a little bit more efficiently if you can give uh, information at the point or some information uh, at the point of seeking to um, uh, book a contact. Um, so we would encourage um, people to share 
a reasonable um, amount uh, of uh, information at, at that point, uh, just to uh, ensure that the process is as short as possible uh, in getting them to uh, the right destination. But if people don't want to share that information with a receptionist, that's absolutely fine. Uh, what will happen then is that uh, a member of the clinical team will contact them and will uh, then uh, start that uh, process of, of triage. It may uh, slightly uh, extend uh, that, that, that process if that clinician has to then uh, move uh, um, um, uh, the inquiry onto somebody else um, rather than the receptionist uh, being able to do that. Uh, but nonetheless, they will still get to uh, the end place and don't have to tell uh, a receptionist anything that they uh, don't feel comfortable doing. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, yes, I, I, I mean, I think varying systems within um, within varying surgeries, I, I don't think it's it's a uniform approach from from what I hear, but I, I, I'm sure that we're all eager to get back to as much um, face to face as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jill. So, uh, and Teresa, so I'll close that item there. Uh, and thank you for the update that is uh, very much welcome and received. So we'll then move on to uh, consent items. Uh, unless there are any objections, I intend to move three of these items on block. So the first I intend to move on block is the first, that's the section 12 doctors, uh, wherein we're asked to ratify the attached list. The second is documents signed under the seal, uh, which Louise has shared and, and asking us to note the list of the documents. And the third is in terms of the charitable funds uh, investment policy uh, and its uh, 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 adoption of uh, ethical principles. So are you uh, happy to move those items on block under consent? Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, happy. Yes. Okay, right. So that leaves uh, the health and safety annual uh, and quarter four report. Uh, Leslie, I think you've got Peter with you. Uh, I think we ought to provide an opportunity to discuss this report and receive any observations, uh, given its nature and the, the extent and uh, comprehensive nature of the information included therein. I've certainly got a couple of questions. But should, Leslie, Peter, shall we take it as read? But can I ask you to highlight any matters of particular note that you would want to, uh, to recognise from the report? Yes, sure. Um, what is our everyone? Um, I think I think the main thing is obviously the the volume of, of riddles that has increased. Uh, previous year we've we've had uh, 105 previous riddles, uh, 2019 to 2020, and last year we had 820. Now obviously that involved 745 that were COVID related. Every one of those had a 72 hour review, uh, a make it safe review and an investigation so the volume of work that has increased we also did 48 health and safety reviews uh 431 social distancing reviews of, of premises um that increase obviously just changed our our whole health and safety priorities for the last year uh we've had obviously some some lessons learned um undertaken from that year whereby we we pull together things like falls information and make sure that uh, the falls group is operational and active. Um, we are seen as a leader in reporting of riddles. Our investigation and line list and process is seen by others as best practice. And obviously we're complying with the law when we're reporting these things. It has been incredibly challenging. And I think uh, it was mentioned earlier the variants and how we can, you know, monitor staff movements and patient movements across wards and how we can, in, you know, investigate those, those cases has been incredibly challenging. But, you know, the work of the team and, and everybody involved has been pretty incredible, really, to make, make places as safe as possible. Um, and, and I just wanted to kind of say that uh, the team has done incredibly well. Uh, challenges we've had to, to deliver what we've delivered the focus now goes you know more more on our general health and safety our estates related work uh, the asbestos the legionella the fire the electrical safety 
still still go on and we've also um done you know contributed to the field hospitals both the commissioning and decommissioning the security arrangements in place across the organization over the last 12 months and 18 months um has been again challenging but we've, we've kind of risen to that challenge as best we could as the team uh, happy to take any particular questions about the report but just wanted to give a brief overview because i recognize everybody would have read the report Thanks, Peter. First question from John. Thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, thanks, Peter and Leslie. It, it was just a, a question really about the RIDAR report, RIDAR reporting from COVID point of view. Is yeah. there a sense that the volume of those reports ha is reducing now that we've got a better handle on handling COVID compared to the early days of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, what we saw in the early part of the pandemic was but large amounts of clusters and the actual health and safety guidance changed um, from likely to probable so so the actual guidance changed on RIDOR by the HSE right and that, that and obviously our genome sequencing information our track and trace information our roster management of staffing um, when we do an investigation now we, we involve all parts of the organization there was an awful lot of volume early on. Uh, we we probably uh, reported large numbers based on the information we had, but we are much better now and the much lower reports now. One one every two, three weeks that we can identify as work-related uh, as opposed to mass volumes early on, yeah. Okay, and do we have a sense that the the the, the better level of reporting for non-COVID ones will continue in that way going forward, do you think? Yeah, I mean, we did see a decrease. Obviously, the 120 previous year, uh, we only had 53 sort of, um, I would say, our normal riddles, musculoskeletal disorders, slip trips, falls. We're obviously focusing on making sure people are reporting those as well. But every time there is a COVID uh, staff member, it's put on Datex and that, that initiates our investigation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bob. John, before you go, uh, in the uh, assurance report, your assurance report from the uh, TRG committee, uh, you, you highlight an issue, I think, around CCTV monitoring. Yeah, CCTV was one of the two things. Um, what was reported to us was <clears throat> a real problem between we've got multiple different systems uh, no ownership of policy and no mm -hmm. common management that's leading to certain issues in terms of one one aspect being of, of which it's impacting our ability to respond to health and safety issues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we recognise that, John, and obviously as part of our business case, um, we're looking at developing the security management system. Um, this year, we've spent 250000 uh, on the security CCTV longer term the idea would be to have a central hub um, based in probably Glen Cluid whereby we can monitor it centrally and manage it centrally um, so there is there is plans to, to look at the whole CCTV system and integrate it rather than it being separately managed and even you know separately maintained by different companies but that is part of the project that states are doing. But I think within that we need some commonality of management now don't we because uh, there are yeah. other issues such as potential risk to not meeting our legal requirements under um for information governance and things and we're not able to respond properly to the police or other inquiries for information mm -hmm. um for sort of crime prevention side of things as well so it's i understand if we've invested in multiple different systems and that mm -hmm. we need to do something as a, a consolidation rationalization to bring it all together Mm. That's that's one aspect, but we still need to be able to wrap around a one common policy and one common yeah. management yeah. approach, don't we? But as soon as possible. And the CCTV policy is in draft, uh, going to the next strategic occupational health and safety group. So, okay, do we know when that is? Uh, it's August. August, right? Okay, so fine. We'll see. We'll know that. See that after. Yeah. That. And the business case is going forward, twenty uh, eighth of July. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Thanks, Peter. Jackie, did you want to come in? 
Uh, yes, please do. Um, Pete, I just wanted to, to um, highlight in this public arena the commendable work that the health and safety team have been doing. Um, they've been phenomenal over the last 18 months. Uh, and I think um, both Jan and Billy, in terms of trade unions, would want to pass on their thanks for the amount of partnership work they've done. Um, so that that was the first point. Um, the second point is around the obligatory responses to to violence in healthcare, um, and it, I think it might be worth high, um, updating the board on actually the progress that's been made in terms of um, offering training to managers. Um, I think I think um, uh, our our, uh, our I've forgotten his uh, title. Yeah. Our manager in that area will. Um, has been doing a lot of work and and gave a presentation for trade unions um, earlier this week, which um, I think we're rolling out to managers, which will be very helpful. Uh, so uh, that was it. Thanks. Uh, Dave Baker is our violence uh, and aggression case manager, um, but but he is working uh, across the organisation and also working with the police on that on those responses uh, to make sure that we learn lessons from uh, security incidents and get better at managing that as well. Thanks, Jackie, for your support. Okay, thanks both. Thanks, Peter. Lynn? Thank you. Hi, Lynn. I'd like to um, support what Jackie's just said about the, the amazing work that your team have done. And if I could then just take you to the recommendations. Mm. There's a whole raft of very broad recommendations here covering every aspect of of health and safety. Do you feel that um, you've got enough resources and capacity, including money, to be able to deliver on all of these recommendations? Well, the, there is a number of business cases Lynn, going, going through uh, the system at the moment. We, we've already um, sort of delivered a couple of those that, that need modifying. Um, all, all four of our business cases are going forward on the 28th of July. And we're obviously uh, hoping that they will progress so that we can, you know, deliver the appropriate service. And do all those four business cases cover all these recommendations? Pretty well, yeah. Yeah, security, manual handling, bit testing, immunisation and training. Okay, so really we need to know the results of those, of those business cases and ask the question after that day. Yeah. I mean, in, ter in terms of manual handling, Lynn, um, um, we have identified premises to be able to take that piece of work forward because one of the issues is that the premises that were were in place pre-COVID are no longer available or not big enough and be for social distancing, etc. So some external premises have been identified. Yeah, um, that's that's changed a lot, Lynn. Actually, that we used to be able to train twenty people um, for manual handling, and with COVID safe environments, we'd, we have, we're down to six. So um, you know. That, that directly influences our, our capacity to deliver the training. Yeah. Um, earlier on, John mentioned um, root cause analysis and um, mm -hmm. non-COVID RIDOR events. And I note that you were not very um, impressed with the way that these, these root cause analysis has been carried out. Mm -hmm. So is mm -hmm. that um, an action you're looking at? Yeah, a, a training programme to make sure that there is consistency. What we're also doing is making sure that the HMTs and area teams are reporting back on lessons learned. So part of the Strategic Occupation Health and Safety Group now, we're asking all HMTs and area teams to report on their safety performance to give us an overview of what, you know, what's being implemented, what policies and systems are in place. So that that's that's starting to come together as well. Okay. It's, it's, it's collective ownership, isn't it? This yes, is just, and it is. And, and I noticed throughout the report, you you know, we need to learn lessons, don't we? Yeah, definitely. Okay. I mean, I think the problem is that sometimes we'll learn a lesson in one part of the organisation that's not transferred. So bringing those lessons to the strategic occupation health and safety group is where those lessons can be learned uh, and, and consistency of policy. So making sure the policies are being implemented through the health and safety reviews, we can, we can look at it back on site. And I'm sure that's something Lucy would wish to be reported to the QSC committee. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So, so before I come to my questions, uh, Lynn has highlighted a point, uh, Peter and Leslie, that uh, and Jill, that I uh, communicated to Joe before this meeting. So I, I, I think, and I'll come back to this, the board can endorse the recommendations set out in the report that do not carry resource implications. 
uh, we, we can't be asked to uh, ensure certain staffing levels until we understand what the financial implications of those commitments are. Yeah, you refer to business cases. We'd expect the business cases to be received by the executive team for them to take a view on them, approve them or not, and then for them to move forward to finance performance committee. So uh, I just want to land that point now. Yeah, uh, that's, un that's understood. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'll come back to that in a moment. So, so and, and just to support that, Mark, um, they are being, uh, they have been discussed at the exec and as Peter described, there is some nuance in taking pl place before they come back to the executive. Okay, and can we just agree, as, a, as we would all know already, uh, Jill, that they'll go to F&P after they've been to ET, the executive team. They'll go to Finance Performance Committee. Yeah, we, we can agree that. Um, I'm sure Sue Hill, our Finance Director, will, will ensure that's on the agenda. Okay. John, did you want to come in on that point? Your hand's just gone up. Yes, just... Just a quick one. I'm not sure that I recall that they're on the uh, business case tracker that we've seen. Just need to make sure it's on that as well so we can track progress. Yeah. Okay. Can you follow that up that side, John, please? I will do. Yeah. Okay. All right. So some, some observations, questions from me, Peter. So good to see that staff injuries are, are, have fallen, but 57 seems far too many to me. Uh, you've alluded to some of the actions around that, uh, mm -hmm. but presumably you are focused with colleagues on that particular topic, along with the wider violence and aggression that you, you know in the report, Peter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, obviously, part of the musculoskeletal injuries um, are potentially as a result of the manual handling issues identified. So additional training and making sure that our training processes are in place. Right. Slip trip falls, falls group established looking at training policy and um, risk assessment process for, for that. So, yeah, we, we identify our themes and that then goes into our strategic objectives for the team. And we're looking at how we measure that. Uh, for example, questionnaires from the manual handling training, can you implement the training back in the workplace? We'll then track that through, through the system. And if people are saying we can't implement this because we haven't got the right equipment, we can then follow that up in the workplace and make sure there's the right equipment, right training. And that's the piece of work we need to focus on now, really, is that we implement whatever measures we put in place, what is the outcome? What is the safety outcome of implementing that system? And that's that's a part of work that we'll be doing over the next 12 months. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Bottom of page five, Peter, uh, in terms of clusters, there's reference in the uh, in the bullet points, the shortage of PPE in work areas. Jill, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't believe the health board ever ran out of PPE at a corporate level. So is that point, Peter, concerned with the distribution of the PPP we have to work areas? Previously, I think there were, there were at times um, during the last year where there was a struggle to get the right PPE um and to be fit tested so making sure all the staff were appropriately fit tested to that ppe was a challenge jill did you want to come in yeah i think i think the point was that the ffp3 masks were being um suppliers were being changed mm. um at short notice so it wasn't about necessarily the supply it was our ability uh to train staff because every time we change a supplier we have to retrain staff uh, so there was a point um, during the pandemic where there was uh, quite a focus on having to retrain staff. We've now introduced a mechanism whereby um, staff hold a, a card. That's correct, isn't it, Peter? Yeah. Uh, and it identifies all the FFP3 masks that they have been trained on. Um, so we're clear about that they are receiving the appropriate equipment for their training. But that was uh, an issue at a point last year. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks both for the explanation. Peter, I'm going to take you to page eight. Uh, annual breakdown of patient-related incidents reported under RIDOR. Uh, 18 listed. Uh, it refers to the investigations uh, being carried out or carried out. Uh, are there any trends, Peter, from those investigations that we ought to be aware of? I, th I think the main, the main issue would have been falls. Um, 
fall, falls of patients and risk assessment. Um, that that is a trend that we are obviously following up through the falls group. But that that's the key issue that we're addressing. Okay, thank you, uh, Leslie. You and I have exchanged about five one and five two being out of date in terms of content. I I understand why because these reports have flowed through committees to get here. Uh, you, you've provided an update. Can I ask that you share that with board members, please? Yes, happily. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then, Peter, final one for me in terms of specifics. Uh, bottom of page 11, uh, needle stick and sharp injuries, mm -hmm. uh, comparative figures. Central is by far the highest site last year for those types of injuries. Mm -hmm. Do we know why? Um, Occupational health will be looking into that. Uh, I can get back to you and describe why that is offline. Okay. I do not know at the moment okay. why it was so much higher. Can I ask you feed that through Jill to me then? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. You happy with that, Jill? No problem. Okay, thank you. So, so returning to what I said earlier, I think at the moment we'll we'll say that we note this report. Peter and Leslie, we support the recommendations that don't carry a resource implication. Yeah. Uh, and we'll look forward to receiving further information about those through business cases after the executive team have considered them. Does that does that sound okay to you? Yeah. That's a Fine. Fine. Thank you. Okay. And can I thank you, Peter and team, uh, as Jackie highlighted earlier on for all the work that's going on in this area. You've certainly brought some focus to what is what is clearly a, an important statutory area of business for, for the health board in the organisation. So thank you for that. And thanks to you, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I will close that item there and we move now on to items for discussion. Uh, and the first is uh, associated with targeting the improvement. Jill, are you taking this in Joe's absence? I am happy to um, mark um, and obviously there's a chair's assurance um, report that directly follows this about the work that we've been doing around uh, targeted improvement as we would like to call it but um, is targeted intervention so this does, does describe I'm not going to go through the paper in detail assume people have read it yeah. but it does describe the progress today and happy for myself and any of the leads to take any questions it should be noted that we've since had another meeting of um, of the task and finish um, steering a task and finish group around the targeted intervention steering group that has uh, happened just this week, and we've also um, started to um, implement the wider governance around the evidence and effectiveness groups. Okay, thanks, Jill. So I'll take the first item first. So in terms of the uh, the framework, are there any questions on the framework update? No, I can't see any hands raised. Jill, I had one. Uh, the, if you uh, go to page three of the report, uh, first paragraph, at the end it notes... Implement the wider governance. No, it, sorry. It, it refers to gap analysis is also planned to identify any attributes in the matrices that require but do not have any actions attached. I, I thought I would have thought we would have done that by now. We're in formulating the the uh, the responses to the four domains, or am I misreading that? You see it, Jill. So on the top of page three. Yes, yeah, this last sentence, gap analysis is also planned to identify any attributes within the matrices that require but do not so, have any actions attached. Yeah, so so um, Simon is, is on video. So before I answer, I'm sure Simon's got an answer on that. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Mark, that, that, that was Jake, an, an ongoing piece of work because what we want to make sure is that, that any actions that are identified as we move through the matrices are also included and linked into the um, annual planning process and are in there so that we uh, so we don't end up with uh, two sets of plans taking us in different directions. So just to confirm then, at this moment in time, we think we've got actions in place addressing all aspects yes. of the four matrices. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Ab absolutely. But there are things on the 
um, in the matrices that aren't in the annual plan, but we know that we're doing. So the board development program isn't in the annual plan, but is linked uh, is a piece of work linked to the matrices. So we just want to make sure that everything is aligned uh, as as far as possible, so that we don't have two uh, two two sets of plans to go to to, to go and view. Okay. It's just trying to make this as business as usual as possible, rather than a separate program. And just to support that, um, Mark, if I may, uh, we also had a discussion at executives yesterday around the structured assessment and ensuring again that we're we're uh, we're cross referencing evidence everywhere so that it does become business as usual. It's the way we do things. Okay. All right. Thank you. So that was my question. You've answered it. Thanks. Uh, we'll go on to the second item. So are there any uh, questions associated with the Chair's assurance report in respect of the, in respect of the targeted intervention framework? Right, I can't see any. So, Jill, thanks for both those documents. Simon, thanks for the clarity. Uh, so uh, we were due to uh, receive the YG Outbreak uh, external review report. I have withdrawn that item. Uh, having spoken to Joe, uh, because I don't believe the review report addresses the terms of reference set for the review. And therefore, Jill has taken that away to, to discuss further with the reviewer and then report back. Is that right, Jill? It is, and that action has been, been I, I have already contacted the reviewer. Okay, and you'll keep us updated? Of course. Thank you, thanks. Okay, so we move on to Vasco. Can I, can I just make one point mark if I may yeah. and that is uh, just to give some assurance to the board recognising it's not full assurance to the board but during the review um, there were no immediate actions requested from the team so so there were no immediate actions of concern following um, as the review was taking place I just think it's it's worth saying that yeah okay thank you that is noted thanks Jill so we'll move on then to vascular task and finish group uh, update. Arpan, there is a report. There are a variety of appendices I know that were shared for, for information of board members. But should we stick to the report? You ready, Arpan? I am, Chair. Sorry, uh, you uh, froze on my screen, so apologies for that. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, uh, this report uh, and the attachments uh, that are in your packs is to provide an update uh, to the board on the state of the vascular surgical service in general uh, and also the programme uh, of work uh, which is uh, underpinning the improvement plan uh, following the RCS review of the service earlier in the year. Um, as you will note in the report, uh, following the receipt of the RCS review, uh, there's been a process of reviewing uh, and refreshing the structural function of the task and uh, finish group as it was previously known. And we have carried out that work uh, already uh, with the help of colleagues from the CHC. Uh, this has now taken the form of a steering group uh, with a number of task and finish groups feeding into it. And this essentially now represents the very large body of system-wide work uh, that we now appreciate is required to address the improvements in a sustainable form. Um, we have undertaken some, um, some real in-depth internal reviews and it has become quite apparent uh, that for sustained benefit uh, from the service for the patients of North Wales, uh, it's important to examine not just the service itself, but also the adjacencies and the interdependencies that impact upon the vascular service itself. Uh, a clear example of this, of course, uh, is the diabetic uh, foot pathway, for instance, uh, because uh, any issues, for instance, which uh, cause uh, problems for patients in reviewing uh, diabetes care and the foot care, uh, for instance, in primary and community care, will eventually impact on how they present into secondary care to the vascular service uh, and this will of course impact on outcome. Uh, so just to illustrate that point. Um, I would like to refer to some key areas in the update as I go along, uh, but it may be helpful to members uh, to note Appendix 1, which uh, describes uh, the hub and spokes model and the availability of the services currently uh, in our three uh, acute hospital sites. 
uh, because uh, one of the key uh, recommendations, of course, has been uh, to recognize uh, the service provision and strengthen uh, the provision of the services in the spoke sites. Uh, if I focus in on the diabetic foot pathway, uh, as I've stated previously, and is being recognized widely, it is not a vascular service pathway, uh, but it is indeed a, a reflection of diabetes care and the pathway uh, that supports that service. Uh, indeed, vascular services, of course, has a very key role to play, uh, as does orthopedic surgery. And some of the work that has gone on in the background successfully, uh, uh, particularly across secondary care, actually reflects uh, the, the very obvious representation of orthopedic services into that foot, foot care process uh, that I'm happy to sort of elaborate on um, if members need that clarification. But certainly it, there, there has been a significant progress across um, the three hospital sites uh, on this matter. And at the end of this week, I hope to uh, further solidify and crystallize uh, the, um, the, the pathway uh, both in the primary community care setting as well as in the secondary care setting. Um, there's been um, uh, comments made, obviously, uh, in the RCS review on uh, pathways in the bed base uh, present in uh, the spoke sites. Uh, now, one of the points to state here is, of course, uh, that bed capacity um, is very much dependent on the clinical pathways uh, that emerge and obviously clinical thinking has progressed and, and has changed uh, since 2013, where some of the original thinking and, and decision-making was derived from. So clearly we are in 2021, uh, and, and although a lot of the clinical thinking and evidence has moved along, uh, I think it is important to state uh, that both the Royal College of Surgeons, uh, as well as some of the uh, more recent reviews across uh, the UK NHS, uh, and I'll uh, make reference to the vascular uh, getting it first uh, pathways. Um, uh, these programs still absolutely support uh, our current model, uh, which of course needs strength. Uh, there is uh, a need for some discussions in terms of uh, the configuration of the bed base across the three uh, DG8 sites. Um, and, and that will require uh, some, um, some discussions based on recent clinical evidence, uh, because much of that work at the moment is really about changing some embedded cultures and some embedded uh, ways of, of, of practicing uh, and, and looking after patients. That process is currently underway uh, and will be continuing um, in, in the fourth uh, one of the other key areas which has been the focus of attention has been uh, the optimal use of the hybrid theatre uh, in uh, Isbidic gland fluid and uh, obviously where the major arterial work has been centralised. Um, it is quite clear uh, that the service model will need um, strengthening in the central site because of the increased demands on the service for more complex uh, work that is undertaken uh, in, in that sphere. Uh, and uh, a number of spot uh, audits of capacity and demand have already taken place. Uh, there are pathways that have been agreed in terms of how the hybrid theater can be utilized in a more efficient and effective manner. Uh, and some of the documents included in the pack uh, will show the evidence in terms of the standard operating procedures that have now been agreed. Um, clearly, there's a there's a large impact in terms of how that scheduling will affect uh, current consultant job plans, and there is a further adjacent piece of work underway in terms of examining uh, the job plans uh, and and may require uh, further uh, expansion in terms of. Uh, consultants and, and other grades that we may need to include in the service going forwards. Uh, that brings me on to the subject of consultant presence, um, which is an important aspect of strengthening the service in the spoke sites as well. Um, so, so one of the, uh, so, so to assure board members, of course, that specialist vascular service 
uh, input is available to the spoke sites 24 uh, seven. However, uh, we have examined uh, what it would take to have a consultant presence, at least uh, on, on, the, on regular working days of the week. Uh, and that has revealed some gaps uh, which are being worked through once again in terms of uh, job planning. Uh, but uh, certainly some innovation has been put in. So in the last couple of weeks, uh, it was possible to have uh, consultants present uh, on all the spoke sites uh, for most of the days, apart from one day when there was some sickness. So there is a detailed job plan as well. Uh, we absolutely acknowledge that there is a need to communicate to our patients and, and, and users uh, what the service actually provides, uh, because sometimes that is also a little bit unclear. So uh, uh, last week, uh, the Executive Director of Workforce and myself met with the communications team uh, to agree uh, principles of uh, communication uh, going forwards, which will consist of a refreshing of uh, the current website uh, to make sure uh, that patients across North Wales and carers become much more aware of um, uh, colleagues who are providing that service uh, in the greater clinical team sense and also the kinds of services that are available. Uh, it's very encouraging that we also have a number of patients who have benefited from the service who are keen to come forward and share some of their patients' thoughts. Um, so I'll stop there and, and take any questions or clarifications. Okay, uh, before I open it up, uh, I'm conscious of the fact this was discussed extensively at the QSC Committee, Quality and Safety Committee, uh, albeit Lucy, the chair, is not here. I believe Lynn was present. Uh, she's got her hand up anyway. Lynn, did you want to give any feedback from QSC Committee before we come on to uh, any questions we might have as a board more broadly? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. That's why I put my hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, we were very fortunate at the last few QSE meetings, and especially at the last one, is that we had the time to forensically go through every single one of these appendix. And we asked questions and we delved very deep and we did put our pen on the spot on a number of issues. Um, our pens covered a lot of the things that need to be done. Our concerns were how had we got to this place? And what could be learned to avoid this happening again? He, Alpan did explain, and you know, we we were we were satisfied. But with this is an area that's got to be constantly monitored. A lot of our questions were centred around what happened since the original decision in two thousand and thirteen. We talked about the beds. We talked about the hybrid theatre, and we also spent a lot of time on understanding what had been referred from the spoke to the hub and vice versa. And we were pleased with the work that had been done to try and sort those pathways out. Although it has to be stressed, we were extremely disappointed that we had assumed a lot of these pathway, pathways were in place. We were also um, happy and pleased to see um, it written down what was being offered on the three main sites and that did give us a lot of assurance. So we need to thank you for that. So it was a very, very good, detailed, lengthy discussion, which we did receive um, the assurances and the reassurances we required. But it is an area that we will continually monitor. So thank you, Arpan, and I think you've done a good, a good presentation of, of what we discussed. So thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. Just on that first point, uh, so Joe and I have had an uh, exchange out with the, uh, this meeting but before we got here uh, and following the QSC committee meeting. Our friend Joe and I are agreed we need to do a look back at some point in terms of this service change and what we could learn from this service change so as to uh, learn the lessons for the future uh, in terms of any other service change that we will undoubtedly be reminded to do at some point. But could you... Bear in mind, Joe's not here, Arpan. Could you pick that conversation up with Jill and uh, Joe uh, after this meeting, please? Uh, most certainly, Chair. And, and, and I would absolutely uh, acknowledge and, and strongly agree with that statement. It's a large, complex organisation and there is learning going on every week. 
So even after, let's say, the QSC presentation, um, um, just as an example, Chris Stockport very kindly flagged up a few issues uh, which I have now addressed, and and it's I, I think there is a there there is a lot of learning personally for me in terms of actually listening, um, in, in terms of what is happening across the organisation, which is large and complex, and not not just rely on on a single source. And I think that that to me is is one of the crucial things how how we actually create that sort of network learning uh, uh, when we when we consider further changes to, to our service provision. But I would. Thank you. Jill, did you want to come in? Yeah, just to say that, that, that Joe has already mentioned that to me. So, so our panel and I and Joe will pick up outside. Second point to make that in the paper, it, it refers to the vascular network ma manager. I understand those interviews this afternoon uh, and we're confident we'll be able to make an appointment. And the third thing, um, you'll understand that Clive Walsh has just joined us in replacement for um, Gavin in a slightly different role. Um, I have asked him to support this piece of work as well. So um, we've got that senior oversight. Okay, thank you. John, did you want to come in? Yes, please, Mark. Um, I've just got a couple of quick questions. One's a, first one's a point of accuracy, maybe, on Appendix 1. It's good to see that descri description, and I know Lynn touched on it, in terms of what happened, what, what was happening at what point. But while we were running that interim two site model, 2015 to 2019, um, what you've got in the document, Arpan, is that we were doing all major and minor uh, vascular procedures on YGC as well. But if we were running the two site model, that was happening um, in... Uh, uh, as we're together and uh, uh, and Wrexham, is that accurate, or am I am I misunderstanding that? Uh, sorry, John. Can I just um, clarify which part we are talking about? Is it the 2015-19 two site model? The, the the middle? In Appendix One, the the section around YGC. We were obviously running the two site the two site model as an interim position until we moved to this the yeah, okay. model. yeah. I, I see I see what you, what you mean. Um, can I clarify that further with the service and come back to you? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And then the second one was one of the other attachments it talked about uh, the one around outpatient joint podiatry clinics at uh, at YG. And on page two, there's a reference about the vascular budget, which is no longer agreed. And it just raised a little flag of concern for me. What what does that statement mean in terms of the budget's no longer agreed? I, I think there's been some conversation in terms of uh, resources and, and where they were derived from. Uh, because clearly, uh, once the vascular service was established, uh, there was an increase in terms of the podiatry requirement. So I think that reflects uh, a, a certain lack of clarity that we are trying to sort of delve into in terms of uh, was the podiatry service also uh, included in that expansion? That's that's my understanding. But once again, I will further uh, delve into that. Okay, thanks, Alpan. Thanks, Thank Mark. you. Okay, thanks both. So uh, we have therefore uh, received the update uh, as recommended, Arpan. Thanks for that update and also for the exchange at QSE. Just to confirm, Arpan, uh, we'd expect another update at the next board meeting by QSE again. Please. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll move on from that item on to urgent care improvement. Jill. Thank you, Chairman. And can I introduce uh, Chris Subi, who has uh, recently been appointed uh, as our clinical lead for unscheduled care across the health board. Very early days for you, Chris, but it's really good to have you here. Um, the, I'm asking the um, the board to receive the paper, and I'm sure you, um, I'm sure that colleagues have read it. Um, there are a couple of points I'd like to call out, if I may, uh, Mark, before opening it up to questions. Um, so. What I want to call out is that all our ED departments are seeing extreme pressure. This has been um, exacerbated by a number of things, including um, 
the requirement to to test patients coming into our organisation, trying to manage red and green pathways, a reduction in beds as a, as a result of the um, requirements around social distancing. And then, as I described earlier in the COVID report, that, that we are actually not seeing the access to care home beds that we've historically had. And again, that has been impacted um, as was called out earlier by Linda, by an increase in tourism in North Wales, um, way beyond what we've experienced previously. And clearly these are um, also accessing our emergency services. There are other points I want to pull out, and that is that we are seeing people that have perhaps not stepped forward um, during the pandemic that are now presenting at our unscheduled care services. This is not unique to North Wales, but we are certainly feeling the pressure. And as a consequence of that, we have had expressions of a concern raised by our ED clinicians who are really, really feeling this at the moment where we've got significant numbers uh, of patients uh, being waiting in our ED departments because of all the reasons that I have explained. Now, as a consequence of a meeting, a chair you and I had, um, and even before that, we would um, we met with um, some ED clinicians and we have um, commenced an improvement programme. Um, that is not a magic bullet, as I'm sure Chris is going to say, but there is a, a number of actions that are now taking place. We have been able to... Um, uh, resource that programme. As I say, Chris is now the clinical lead on that. We are starting to re resource the support for him that sits around that, including analytical support so that um, we can see the areas that most need help or, or best opportunities. And a lot of this is also about how we manage our public and public expectations of how they can manage themselves without resorting to our ED departments. We have met again with the ED uh, lead, consultant lead um, in uh, Isbeth Gwyneth um, and absolutely recognise the pressures that all our, our staff uh, are working under at the moment. Um, we do have locality plans that are owned by the localities. When I say locality, that will be our east, west and centre teams working in partnership across the community and the hospitals. Um, but um, and, and those are, are beginning to not only formulate, but we're beginning to start to pin down the actions and the outcomes, ex outcome expectations of those plans. Um, I'm going to hand you over to, uh, to Chris, if I may, to just describe the work that he has been undertaken in the short time he's been with us. But um, your impact, I know, is being felt, Chris. So thank you for joining us. Um, good morning. Yeah, J just to say, uh, my name is Chris Subi. I'm a consultant in acute respiratory and critical care medicine and a senior clinical lecturer at Bangor University. Um, um, most people in this clinical sphere will know me from the work that we've done around deteriorating patients uh, um, when we created uh, pathways and tools uh, to reduce uh, rate of cardiac arrests across North Wales by about 80% across the three hospital sites and when we uh, developed uh, the national early warning score and the tools that um, have spread from North Wales back uh, into the UK and around the globe. Um, this is an extremely difficult area and I started on the 5th, so exactly 10 days ago, um, uh, with my involvement in this program. So uh, what um, myself and the project manager and the team around us is trying to do at the moment is to get um, a, a better handle on the data, um, see where we think that the early wins might be, uh, and, and with lots of um, um, staff on all three sites. And um, so I spent a whole day in Wrexham yesterday, I spent a whole day in Glen Cluid, uh, the day before, and I'm continuously talking at the moment to uh, particularly clinical leads who will have to deliver on some of this. So th the first month is around metrics and engagement. And we hope that at the end of this month, we'll be able to uh, have programs uh, that we can share um, and then start to realize. 
Um, and the, you've see, seen in the paper that there are themes that uh, have been identified already, um, and we're focusing on delivering um, uh, those uh, and uh, underpinning them with the metric that will drive them. And um, one of the things that I've been very clear on when I started is uh, that we need to have a metric that is understood by everybody. Uh, that's the public, uh, that's the clinician, and that's my managerial colleagues. Uh, and we will be uh, very open about what this metric is and how we will track this. Uh, but this will take a bit of time so that we really got buy-in uh, to do this. Um, I'm not sure what uh, more details I should uh, add at the moment, but maybe uh, questions might be a way to um, address uh, concerns or uh, questions that are in uh, the participants participating uh, people uh, on the call. Thanks, Chris, and welcome to your first board meeting. I've got a question from John first. John? Thanks, Mark. Welcome, Chris. A um, couple of points from the paper. One on page three, there's a graph included. Um, and apart from the obvious outlier around COVID, around uh, March, April, uh, um, March, April, May, whatever it is, there doesn't seem to be a clear correlation between the tendencies and actually the performance. So what struck me was, is there something more fundamental underlying our overall performance in ED uh, that's not actually to do with attendances or, or, or ambulance handovers and that we need to address that uh, patient flow in a different way? Um, I, I think you know. Um, I think you're right. Uh, these these graphs don't give us really an explanation of what is happening, and why it is happening. And I think that's one of the pieces of work uh, that we're undertaking at the moment. Uh, on the whole, I think they're pretty flat. There isn't much in terms of change, um, and this is um, a complex adaptive system. Um, and I think what you really picked out is that this is not a linear system. So you move one parameter, all other parameters will move in a predictable way. This is a complex adaptive system. Uh, so when you start to move one parameter, all parameters might move in different uh, directions. Uh, and that's the reason why I think we need to uh, have agreement within the clinical teams which ones of those things we really think is the one that tells us what patient experience, patient outcome is. And dare I say it, uh, staff experience, which has been exceptionally challenging um, uh, over the last few months. Uh, and, uh, and, and th this graph at the moment, unfortunately, doesn't give us this analysis. Um, and, and I think you absolutely I agree with you. OK, thanks. I think that goes to the second question then to me, which is further on in the paper, bottom of page five, around the, the improvement programme. It talks about reducing harm, improving patient outcomes, but it just struck me as being too generic. Mm -hmm. Can we be more specific about what outcomes we're being aiming at, about setting expectations? Mm -hmm. That's going to help drive in better improvement, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in, in both uh, the interview and uh, all the conversations that I've had in the 10 days that, uh, since I started to say, for the first month, uh, we will tell you the process. We're consulting with everybody that we cannot get our hands on. And we will then def uh, define publicly what outcomes we're focusing on. And there will be trackable. And there will be trackable for anybody who wants to track them. Um, at this moment in time, we haven't agreed those with clinical leads. And I think it would be uncautious uh, to do this uh, uh, in, in this forum. No, I, I accept that, but it, uh, keeping us advised that that is the aim to do that, I think helps in, in terms of assurance for us in terms of... Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and just to support um, Chris on that, John, I think um, you know, all of the work we're doing now in determining what those metrics are and what the outcomes are, because this isn't a target, it's a standard as a standard, we should be applying to the people that are using our services. Uh, we serve the public. We shouldn't forget that. Um, and actually, we need to be really clear on what they are and the reporting framework behind those. So, you know, yeah. you will see changes in the reporting um, papers that you've historically received around unscheduled care through to uh, board subcommittees as a consequence of that. So we're making it explicit. I think the other point I would say is um, the numbers are absolutely right. They're not the whole story. As I said, we've lost beds across the system. We know that and we're having to manage in a very different way. 
um, and that's having an impact as well. But all of that comes under the analysis that, that Chris is doing, which is why we uh, he is being supported by uh, full-time analytics, which is uh, a different way of managing this moving forward and, and I think being very well received by Chris and the team. All right. Thanks, Jill. Thanks very much, Chris. Back Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Jackie, next. Thank you. Um, hi, Chris. Um, I suppose I'm not sure whether to describe myself as fortunate or unfortunate in that I get to attend the daily huddle, particularly in, in as much So I've seen the challenges that our um, medically fit for discharge patients present to the team in terms of flow. Um, what I really wanted was some uh, assurance or reassurance that um, diagnostics are fully involved in this process. Um, as we all know that timely access to imaging in particular um, aids the flow that we have of our patients through through the hospital. So I just wanted some assurance around that, please. Um, I, I think this is a whole system design um, a, a project. And, and as I um, said before, Jackie, the problem is that all these parts hang together. They interact with each other. So you're absolutely right. If I haven't got access for patients to timely uh, imaging, uh, I can't establish a diagnosis. I can't start the right treatment. I can't predict uh, the uh, the rate of recovery. Uh, I can't communicate to the patient when they are likely to be able to return to their own home. Uh, so, so that that's absolutely part of part of the process. And, and thanks for raising it. Mm. And again, just to add, Jackie, we had a conversation yesterday at the executive team uh, about. Um, planned care and diagnostic element of planned care and the challenge was put back well how do we resource diagnostic for unscheduled care as well uh, because the one absolutely um, um, impacts on the other so so the challenge was sent back to the diagnostic team to, to bring those two pieces together because completely cognizant uh, of, of what you've just described. Okay thank you. Nikki? Hi, Chris. Um, so I want to commend the um, data analytics approach and also the systems approach to this. I think it's absolutely fabulous. Um, but the, the common thread that runs through this is the patient. So I just wondered, in terms of that patient experience, is sort of the qualitative uh, piece going to come into this to help um, inform service improvement? Um. Um, thank you for raising that question. I can only partially answer that question at the moment. Uh, what we're really pushing for at the moment is uh, in the value-based healthcare framework to have patient-related outcome measures. For unscheduled care so far, there are no patient-related outcome measures. We only got some very incomplete um, questionnaires that capture some of the experiences. Now, uh, <laughs> At the moment, they tell us what we can see if we just go to the front of the hospital. The experience is not the way we want it to be. Um, I will give a supplementary answer to this. I'm um, National Lead for Quality Improvement for the Society for Acute Medicine, and we have over the last uh, couple of months agreed priorities for the society, for, so for the UK-wide body of acute physicians uh, for improvement. And those uh, you'll be delighted to hear are uh, expansion of same-day emergency care. How is that done well? What's the metric that underpins it? And how is it done? And uh, we are commissioning uh, specific training for this. And as a second workflow, we have uh, uh, agreed to develop patient-related outcome measures for unscheduled care. We're doing this internationally. Um, we've got uh, some Dutch PhDs already done significant work on this, uh, so that we hope that uh, later on this year we'll be able in a, to be in a position that we can start testing some of those in the UK setting. So I will be able to give you a good answer to that next year, but not this year. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Jill, just coming back to the conversation you referred to yesterday that you, Joe, uh, and I had with Nikki, the clinical lead for the emergency department at uh, Especially Gwyneth. I, I think we, we all come away thinking, uh, we, we know of the concern that exists, of course. You know, you and I have met with three clinical leads previously, but they, they, they obviously want some sense of greater recognition that we are working to resolve the, the challenges that they face. And, and I guess they want some sort of sense of 
immediate assistance. Uh, the longer term program will take some time. Uh, I, I think though, Jill, you I'm sort of take away the business case yesterday, check where it was to see if there are any interim solutions that we can offer to Nikki and the team. Could you just confirm? So yes. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry, Chair, sorry for talking over you. Um, yes, I, I can confirm that I've um, made contact around the business case. There was a meeting yesterday, understand yesterday morning. Um, there are some slight amendments to that, and I have been advised that I'll have that on Monday. I'm also planning, I think Nikki is on leave next week, Chairman, uh, but I have um, dates in the diary for myself, and I'm sure... Uh, Chris will be there in his bitty uh, Gwyneth um, to walk the floor and see what the immediate opportunities are. So, yes, that is being taken forward alongside some of the um, uh, the recognition of walking the floor is um, also looking at what alterations we could make environmentally. But I would like to um, reaffirm, Chair, that uh, we will be looking at this across the whole of North Wales. Yeah. So, so this will include uh, is a bit of kind fluid and is a bit of minor. Okay, thanks, Jill. Chris, final word from you. Yeah, I, I could just add to this. You know, outside of this particular role that I'm talking to about today, um, I'm obviously also an acute physician working at the Spitty Guinness. We've got some um, uh, projects that we're starting in the next week that will hopefully help to release some of this uh, pressure, which to a degree is uh, driven by medical emergency. Uh, admissions. So, you know, I'm hoping to be able to report certainly by mid-August whether those are having effects or not. That would be helpful. Thank you. So, in terms of this particular item, we are asked to uh, note the concerns raised by the Emergency Department of Clinical Leads, and that was uh, repeated yesterday in a meeting with Nikki at Spotty uh, and to receive an update on urgent and emergency care improvement and the programme of work. Are members happy to do so? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, Jill, uh, can we agree outside when we'll get the next update, please? Yes, we can. And, and I'll agree that with Chris as well. So, it's a meaningful update, Chairman. I'm sure it would have been meaningful anyway, Jill. Okay, thank you. Jump it out. So, okay, we are at a uh, comfort break time. So, it is quarter past 11. Can I ask that colleagues dial back in at uh, 20, uh, 25 past? We've got 10 minutes, please. Thank you.
Okay, it's uh, 25 minutes past 11, uh, and I would like to start the meeting again, please. Mark, are you there? The next item is the quality and performance report. You are. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Abaradar. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to present the performance report of the Health Board. It summarises our performance up to the end of um, May this year. I'm going to open up this item and then I'll ask colleagues to, to contribute as appropriate. Welsh Government performance management of us as a health board remains um, suspended because of the uncertainties created by the pandemic and that limits our access to comparative information to, to, to fully understand our, our performance um, at present. Nonetheless, the report highlights areas where we are performing relatively well and I would like to highlight those um, as well. The immunisation of children, um, healthcare associated infection, performance against a suspected cancer pathway tends to be strong and that has that has um, that has continued to be an area of relatively good performance for us. I'd like to highlight radiology as well. We've, see, we've seen a month-on-month -month consistent reduction in the number of people waiting over eight weeks for a diagnostic test and the executive team yesterday were committed to additional uh, non-recurrent investment using the monies that we secured from, from Welsh Government to improve access and that should see us without any over eight week waiters by the end of March 22. So that's all really positive. Um, I think in terms of areas where we are less strong, we've just had a big discussion around unscheduled care, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that anymore, but clearly the report uh, presents, I think, some of the challenges that we currently face around unscheduled care. I think the report also highlights CAMS and neurodevelopment, where our performance is less strong, and we may wish to get that up in the discussion. That is an area and a priority for investment that we've recognised in our plan. We will also be looking to sign off um, later on this on. on on, on this agenda. So we've set aside some resources now within the plan. We've got some clear commitments, but we now need to move towards full implementation in those areas. So I think those are the opening comments I wish to make, uh, Mark. I'm happy to uh, take any questions, as I'm sure are my colleagues as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so I'll open it up to questions. Any questions on the report? Uh, I can't see any questions, Mark, which is unusual for this item. Okay, Chair. so... Oh, sorry, sorry, Chair. Is it worth noting that this report has gone through several committees, so many of the questions will have been picked up in the local committees? It is, yeah. Thank you for that, Jill. Cheryl, did you, were you just trying to come in? Yes, Chair, thank, thank you very much. Um, I, ju just to mention the um, CAMS and children's performance, this, this had a very thorough going at uh, QSC uh, committee, continues to obviously disappoint very much, but I'm confident that uh, the, the measures we're, we're currently getting into place are going to see um, a, a really good improvement um, in this. Uh, we can only hope because it, it just isn't good enough. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, Lucy, thanks, Cheryl. Lucy? Thank you, Chair. Um, we did uh, discuss in, um, uh, in QSE committee that um, there was reference made to the primary care um, access indicators, um, but there was no actual information within the document about these. Um, but I note as well, we still don't have any primary care indicators in here. Can you give us a timescale, please, on, on when this is going to be addressed? Because it's an area that we are receiving a lot of scrutiny and questions on at the moment. Okay, thank you, Lucy. So you, you're aware of the timescales for the work that we're doing to redevelop the uh, the broader um, IQPR report, um, but I think within the, within those timescales, uh, there is an opportunity to include some primary care indicators. I'd like to commit to those being included in this report uh, to some extent um, starting with the next board meeting because we do have those indicators and we should be able to include them. I'm happy to give that commitment um, to the board. Thanks, Mark. If we've got them, why have we not been reporting on them? 
So our reporting tends to focus on the um, those indicators that we are held to account for um, by the um, the Welsh government. So we tend to focus on those. Um, but I think we do have lots and lots of data. Uh, clearly, only a subset of that is ever reported through to the board and committees. Uh, but I accept the point you're making, and we should be able to include that in a future report. Um, I think we need to do some work as an executive team uh, to work out the indicators that are most meaningful and the most aligned to the strategic objectives that we've got around primary care. Um, but it's very hard to, um, but, but you know, clearly we do have some indicators and it's hard to defend no reference at all to primary care in this report. It's a commitment I'd like to offer. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that because, as I said, we, we are getting a lot of scrutiny in that area at the moment. So thank you. Thanks, Lucy. And Mark, we discussed that ourselves, didn't we, yeah. last week in our catch-up. Yeah. That was uh, my expectation too, which I know you agreed to respond to. Okay. Uh, Gareth, next, please. Well, Doug, good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question actually about unscheduled care. It, it felt more relevant to ask it against performance rather than against the, the previous item. Um, I'm aware, I think as many people are, that the minor injury units in North Wales have had a, um, a slightly um, more unstable year, really, with COVID in terms of their ability to open and support and schedule care across the region. I wondered whether there'd been any uh, analysis of impact of the closures of MIUs actually on our uh, ED uh, performance, uh, whether numbers were perhaps... Um, small uh, and, and therefore didn't impact on, on our performance or whether the numbers uh, over the year or so have, have, have actually uh, caused our performance to uh, to reduce. So I can comment on that a little bit. Jill or Chris may be, uh, may be able to add a bit more, Gareth. Thank you for your question. But we do, we, we have had a whole series of temporary closures, I think predominantly around our MIUs uh, in the West. Um, Dolgetli, um, and in other places um, in the West as well. They are temporary closures, uh, predominantly related to staffing um, uh, issues we've faced and, you know, conscious decisions to redeploy resources to areas of greatest need. Um, I can see that Jill's come in as well, so I don't know if Jill or Chris are able to pick up the analysis. The analysis uh, so, point. so in terms of the analysis, Gareth, that's a question that Chris talked about the analysis that, that we're doing as the team to look at the impacts in various uh, places, and that is part and parcel of it. it it's also part of um, the conversation we're having about the skill mix to support um, in different ways. So, yes, Gareth, it is being picked up. Gareth, not, not very much more to uh, comment upon than, than Jill has just uh, mentioned, other than just to uh, reference the fact that uh, as well as looking about the uh, impact into secondary care, um, we are uh, looking at uh, the impact upon those uh, individual teams that are delivering MIUs and what do we need to go forward to uh, make uh, that uh, a more stable offering. As, as you're aware, some of our MIUs are quite small uh, and it may be that there is only one uh, advanced practitioner um, uh, within the team uh, on any particular shift and in, in that um, environment, COVID um, and um, uh, the implications of COVID uh, have had uh, uh, far more of an impact uh, than, um, uh, than you would otherwise imagine because of the difficulties in cross covering uh, and some of the difficulties of keeping red and green separate in small community hospitals. So we've reflected upon and are reflecting upon um, what uh, what the impact of COVID has in terms of how we can stabilise uh, MIUs going forward. Okay, thanks everyone. John? Thanks, Mark. Um, at the risk of repeating myself from uh, f and I thought it might be worth just highlighting um, a couple of the positives that are there in terms of the improvement in stroke and uh, the reduction in the RTT number. Um, I'm, and I did ask at FMP about whether the fall in the performance uh, of the follow up, so the increase in numbers of follow up appointments, is linked to that um, improvement in RTT. Sorry, John, can you just repeat that question, please? We've, in, we've improved the, the the number of patients for referral treatment in terms of the numbers yeah. reduced. Yeah. 
is it a consequential increase that we've seen in the follow-up appointment number? Because that's that's gone up. Right. Okay. Um, so I think it's hard to be definitive. Clearly, if people have moved through our outpatient system, they may move into the follow-up uh, waiting list. So that is one explanation of that. But in terms of the shape of the curve, I think it's difficult to be uh, that specific uh, about, you know, which kind of cohorts and timings and things like that. Okay. I think the other discussion we had at FMP was about whether validation had made um, some some impact as well, and we have done some validation off the waiting list to think of not has knocked a few thousand uh, people off. Um, we have seen a genuine increase in 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 our ability to restart uh, planned care, and on some information I saw yesterday, we're delivering between about seventy and eighty percent now of what we're delivering um, in a pre-pandemic. Uh, period. So, so we have seen a significant recommencement of primary care, planned care, sorry. Okay, thank you. And and the other one, because Jill referenced, you know, that we're becoming, a, a, seeing more tourists in North Wales um, as a, as a, because we're becoming more of a destination. Mm. So how much of our drop in ED performance is linked to that increase in tourists? Um, that's a difficult question to answer. I think we need to go away and have a look at that. Um, I think that if we looked at ED and MIU attendances, we, we have seen a marked increase, certainly since the depths of the winter. It's not gone up a tremendous amount over the last over the last few weeks. Um, not sure about the connection between tourists and people being admitted into our hospitals. I think it's a very strong connection between tourists and, and attendances at, at our ED and MIUs. Hopefully, most of those individuals don't end up needing to be needing to be um, um, admitted. But I think that is something we'd need to go away and have a look at that. I'm not sure if you've got any more information on that, Jill. I haven't got any more information, but it is something that I've asked for some work to be undertaken on, particularly given the fact that we are about to move into the highest level of tourist season when the schools break up and, and we're seeing the uh, changes in the lockdown rules. Okay. So, I think you want to come in. Uh, if I may, um, in preparation for uh, this morning's uh, the meeting that Lucy and I attended, I asked a specific uh, question about the number of inpatients who were registered um, to an English address. And um, as of excuse me, as of um, the midnight count, it was uh, forty one inpatients across all of our uh, hospital sites. So in combination with the number of um, the reduced bed availability because of social distancing and so on, not an insignificant number, um, bearing in mind um, uh, delayed, delayed transfers of care and so on, John. Um, and I, each ICU does have COVID patients in at the moment, no breakdown on um, 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 postcode for, for ICU. Okay. We also get tourists from South Wales as well, don't we? So that would... Well, I, can, I can tell you outside. Outside. I'll, yes. I'll let you know where people have come from. It is mainly the northwest. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Mark, as well, and Jill. Okay. Linda, I think you've got a question. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. It follows from John's question and the question I asked earlier. Could I raise concern that the community hospital in Dolgatla is closed at the moment? I understand it's temporarily, but this, in particular, given the conversation, Given the um, tourists around, it does raise concern because there is no hospital close. Um, and I'm sure many other community hospitals are in similar position. I know that. Could I ask for a commitment that if this is a problem, staff shortage, that this is considered as a priority? that these units do not close temporarily because this, this is worrying for me. And the lack of services that we can offer anywhere, 
which is close to the people, people's homes. I think it's true for other areas as well. Thank you. Hi, Chris, if you want to uh, comment on that. I absolutely agree with you, uh, Linda, and I'm very happy to give uh, that commitment to the, um, the West Area team, which of course is uh, specifically uh, related to Dog FI Community Hospital, uh, already have uh, an action plan um, in place to um, to move things forward, they they minimise as far as possible uh, the closures, but any closure does have an impact in a uh, rural area, uh, particularly a rural area that is um, uh, popular uh, for, for, for tourism, for all the reasons that you've just mentioned. Um, so um, they are uh, minded uh, to increase um, their, uh, their, their staffing uh, contingent uh upon uh training you 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 will be aware that um um training a, a, a an extended uh, scope practitioner to run a, a minor injuries unit uh does require uh, some uh, support but i have seen the plan that the team have got in place um we will go back and just make sure that uh, absolutely uh, every um uh, every uh, option that we have to uh, speed that up um, it, it is being played through, um, uh, but I'll give that commitment um, without uh, any uh, any hesitancy at all. Yeah, thank you. And just to add to that, working collaboratively with Chris on that because there is work being undertaken across secondary care uh, and the area to to see how we can support the staffing and that. I do think we've got to look at st different staffing models, but all of those things are in the mix. And we have had MIUs for similar reasons, um, including, as I go back, we've got a number of reasons why staff aren't present, including uh, self-isolation in some areas. We've seen some of that in the east as well. So we've seen the impact um, North Wales wide. And we do completely understand the impact this not only has on and our patients' their ability to get somewhere that's less local, but on our ED department, so it is a priority. Okay, thanks both, Dioch and Linda. John, do you want to come back in? Sorry, Mark, no, is my hand still up? I'll take it down. Thanks, thank you. So, so Mark, a couple of questions from me. Well, the first is directed to Joe, actually. So, Joe, could you uh, let the board know where we are, please, in terms of the dialogue with Welsh Government about the diagnostic and treatment centres? We cleared the business case as a board. I know dialogue has been taking place. I'm concerned that uh, it's a priority for us and a priority it will be for our communities. Uh, so what's the update, Jeff? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, actually, very timely. Um, following the conversations at... Um, this morning's um, North Wales uh, meeting, um, Dr. Goodall was extremely explicit about the size of the waiting list um, challenge at, at the cabinet meeting uh, today. And uh, by agreement, um, I followed up um, with um, references, uh, not specifically to the DTC um, in, in that um Fora, but but more generally about the need for long term uh, capacity in North Wales to balance um, our uh, uh, demand uh, for and uh, planned care and our capacity to provide that care in North Wales, and his um, response was um, quote um, um, helpful in terms of, of the range of, range of the conversations that he is managing uh, within uh, Welsh Government. Uh, we're clear uh, working in partnership with colleagues at the Welsh Government Delivery Unit um, around the work that we need to do uh, to support the conversations Welsh Government are seeking to uh, have uh, with, with colleagues with regard to the opportunities uh, for a, a partnership uh, approach uh, with regard to the provision of um, uh, facilities associated with, with a DTC. And um, those uh, conversations are proceeding positively uh, with a strong indication that um, ourselves and one other health board 
are seen as as being um, in inverted commas uh, front runners uh, for uh, these kinds of conversations. That's um, you know, that that's a, a very nice general update. Um, however, uh, I, as I know, the board are keen uh, to um, ensure that there's a, a clarity around an endpoint to these enabling conversations so that we can continue to make um, progress in order to create the capacity that we believe we need uh, to deliver um, a sustainable long-standing uh, reduction in uh, waiting time numbers in, in North Wales. My view is that the conversations have a little while yet to run um, um, in partnership uh, with our colleagues in, in Welsh Government. Uh, but I would expect you to ask for a further update at our next board meeting, by which time we should be clear which approach we are continuing to use. The traditional DTC approach as per the business case, which stands approved by this board, um, or the uh, alternative, um, more speedy uh, partnership approach, which is under active discussion at this moment in time. Thank you. Joe, bearing in mind the next board meeting is two months away, can I suggest that uh, you and I uh, review the situation perhaps in two weeks uh, and, and if not had a positive signal or, or some sense of uh, a, a clear deadline for resolution, then we consider uh, writing formally, or I consider writing formally to the Minister. Very comfortable with that suggestion, Mark. I think that's deliverable. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, Mark, I've got a couple of other questions uh, associated with this report. Uh, and, and it's the fact there are reference in different places, Mark, to business cases under consideration. Uh, for example, endoscopy is one. So the reference under RTT to, to outsourcing in a business case. And there's a, I, I know there's other consideration going on around uh, cataract and, and cataract centre. C could uh, at some point, Mark, the board have greater clarity around which business cases are active in the conversations within the executive team? Mm -hmm. And when we're likely to know what the executive team wants to or intend to move on? because I, I think it goes to the heart of some of the challenges that we face, uh, which are alluded to in this report. But I think we need greater clarity about what's moving forward and what's not. So I think one, one part of that we're now doing via the business case tracker, which details all the business cases, both revenue and capital. And I think from memory, that's due to go to the next meeting of the FNP. So I think that provides one route to, uh, to give clarity. But of course, we can, we can, of course, do that in other settings to board members outside if the board would find it would find it helpful i would mark okay that's joe was nodding as well i think jill was as well okay thank you so i will now move us off that item so i don't see uh, any other questions uh being listed and we'll go into uh, the, the finance uh, reports of month one and two so uh, can we do what we traditionally do, take these as read and perhaps concentrate on the second of the reports because that's the most recent and relevant? Hi, Mark. Yes, of course. So uh, thank you for um, the intro to the finance report. So the focus on the month two report um, really is to be considered in light of the revised annual plan, which was submitted to Welsh Government at the end of June, which the board is considering later on the agenda. So. The Health Board is currently forecasting a break-even position for the year, having delivered a break-even position at month two. And at this stage, um, I just wanted to remind the uh, Board that the financial forecast includes the £82 million of Welsh Government strategic support that we have received this year, £40 million of which relates to the deficit cover, £30 million for performance improvement, and £12 million for mental health, learning disabilities and capacity and capability across the organisation. And it also now includes the £19.9 million that we have received after successfully bidding against the COVID-19 £100 million recovery funding announced for Wales. 
The financial impact of COVID-19 is obviously still a significant factor in our financial reporting as well. And the current estimate was around three, uh, 100 million pounds this year, which um, is in light of the 169 million that we eventually uh, incurred last year. And that is fully funded by Welsh Government. Um, I think I would probably leave the update there but I'm happy to take any questions from the committee, from the board. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sue. John, as Chair of Finance Performance Committee, is there anything you wish to add? Um, nothing too specific. I think the main conclusions for me and the committee was that, you know, we've still got some concerns about the initial savings performance, um, but it's a positive forecast. No, to break even as we're going forward in the year. So um, nothing too great in terms of concerns at the moment, but just a slight note of cautionary savings. Okay. So can I just be clear, Sue? Because uh, there's reference to a variety of funding streams and covering the, the lack of delivery of savings last year. So do we still need to deliver £17 million worth of savings this year to break even? We do. It's currently included in the forecast. Right, OK. So that goes to John's point about uh, concerns to ensure that those savings are delivered in some way, shape or form. Yeah. We, we discussed that in the executive team meeting yesterday morning. Yeah. And we are starting to do um, monthly meetings with all of the divisional directors just to get clarity around those savings programmes. Obviously, the FDU has currently, has recently launched a vault of um, information around benchmarking opportunities, and all of the CFOs are actually currently reviewing that data to make sure that they are aware of the main opportunities for their own area. And we're having um, a sort of a workshop on that later this month. So I'm hopeful that will deliver, you know, more um, more confidence in the savings forecast but we need to bear in mind that we delivered 18 million last year during covid so that was why we set the target at 17 million because it's a realistic number for us to deliver okay so just to confirm so you're assuming responsibility with the executive team as director of finance for the savings delivery yeah. just it yesterday uh there's work in train but you'll be reporting progress to finance performance committee oh well yeah. Okay. Any other questions around the finance report? I can't see any notified. So, okay, we'll move off of those two reports. Thanks. So those reports are noted by the board. So we come on to the group uh, chair's assurance reports. Uh, again, I'm going to take these as a bread. Uh, and a number don't seek to escalate any matters to the board. So uh, I will briefly uh, turn to them and then uh, ask the chair to present a particular one of our highlights. So, Medwin first, the Audit Committee report. Um, the Audit Committee on the, on the 6th of June, a lengthy meeting and very comprehensive, as you can see from the paper, as far as matters arising, and to be referred to the board, they're all listed in the paper, financial and matters that were approved in the committee, noting the approval to the risk policy. We discussed this and then approving the framework for governance, integrated framework that we will be discussing later. But also to note the concerns that were raised in relation to the uh, limited assurance in relation to pe uh, temporary staff. Bit disappointing given that this problem has been uh, shown 12 months earlier as well. And also the fact that the committee and me as chair, we felt that it was unacceptable that the auditors had struggled to get information from the workforce um, in a timely manner. 
But as far as the rest of the paper is concerned, it's all there. And just to confirm, as far as the assurance, the chief of staff was there and she confirmed that she would take matters forward and, and she may be able to report back on the progress made and the decision to do anything in relation to that. Okay, thanks, Maybrin. So the, the, the section D with matters requiring escalation to the board, we're asked to, to note a variety of things, uh, including the concerns about the interim staff in limited assurance report, which, uh, as I think Maybrin knows, I picked up at the time with the interim chief executive and also the director of workforce. Uh, and the, to note in particular the approval of the integrated governance framework. Are we happy to do that? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, may win. So, Lucy, uh, 4th of May, so quite some time ago. Anything you want to highlight from the QSE assurance report? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I updated the board at the last meeting in relation to the, the, the May agenda, actually, um, uh, regarding particularly vascular and the YGC improvement plan items. Um, anything, I don't have anything further to highlight from that particular meeting, but I'm to answer any questions. Thanks, Lucy. I don't see any questions, so, so the ARC will move on. Uh, Finance Performance Committee. John? I'm up. Um, really just to highlight the, the key risks around unscheduled care, which we've, we've talked about um, with the continued pressures. Uh, and the planned care side, and but acknowledging that there's work going on to deal with that. Um, those really are the, the key concerns from the Finance Committee point of view at the moment. Thanks, John. So, uh, Charitable Funds Committee, Jackie, anything from you? Uh, th thanks, Mark. Um, there's nothing to highlight apart from the fact that we've just approved the ethical policy for charitable funds. So, thank you for that. We have. Thank you. Uh, Mental Health Act Committee, Lucy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I just wanted to highlight we received the annual report for deprivation of liberties and discuss the implications of the, uh, the new um, liberty protection safeguards, which are due to come into force next year under the new legislation. The resource impl implications of, of this particular area are significant. Um, as a result of both the changes to the process under the new legislation and the anticipated increase in numbers. So as you can see from my report, a task and finish group has been established, but this is an area under particular scrutiny at the moment, and I'll be seeking assurance um, on this as it progresses. Okay, thanks, Lucy. You are breaking up a bit, but I, I, I got most of that, so thank you. Rats, uh, the uh, report is uh, there. I've got nothing that I wish to escalate to board. Uh, we have uh, SPPH committee next. Lynn, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you'll see that we covered a whole range of issues and, and we went into detail on each one. If I'd just like to identify some of the key risks, we were concerned that the um, business continuity plans hadn't yet evidenced that we were able to test them as part of the major incident planning, and we're expecting a report at our next meeting. Um, we did note that we need to spend more time on the regional partnership board, and that will be a focus of a workshop um, in, the, in the imminent future. So matters to be escalated to the board is to ask you to receive the annual equality report. And I took the liberty, which is very unusual in these chairs' updates, is to ask for an, a summary to be attached I just felt there was such good work that was being done that it was valid and right that we recognise all the excellent work. Thank you. I agree, and I'm sure we've all read and noticed that, Jill. Good, Lynn, thanks for doing that. Thank you. I don't see any questions listed. So, John, DRGC committee. Thanks, Lynn. It didn't go off mute. Sorry. Um, um, the reports are as read. I think there are two key issues to raise the board, one of which we've talked about, um, which is CCTV. Um, there are some real concerns there in terms of the 
the lack of management and the lack of policy around the CCT systems we've got in the organisation, and that's exposing us to some significant risk and, and uh, inability to actually deal with some of the issues that, that it should be contributing to. Uh, the other one is keynotes and alerts, which is to do with the um, patient administration systems. Uh, we, we're at risk of not fully complying with Data Protection Act if we don't get a handle on that. Um, so I'm hoping that we can get some clear commitment to addressing both of those issues. So I think we got the first, did we not, from Peter in terms of CCTV? Yes. So we're now on to the keynotes and alerts. It was Chris at the meeting as their executive lead for digital. Chris, were you there? And are you undertaking to take it away? Yes and yes. Okay. So uh, will you update John outside in due course, Chris? Yeah, uh, very happy to. All right, thanks, Chris. I'm assuming it'll come back as well via the committee as well in terms of an update or wherever yeah. we like with, with, with committees. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, that. So uh, next report is stakeholder reference group. Uh, Claire's not with us, Mark. Mark, is there anything you want to highlight from this report? You're on mute, Mark. Sorry, just to advise the board um, that I'm pleased to be working with Claire uh, Budden, who is the uh, chair designate for the uh, for the SRG ministerial approval. I understand is waited on that appointment, and also Councillor Mike Parry being elected as the vice chair uh, of the SRG. Uh, there's nothing I wish to highlight on the report, Mark. Thank you. I can confirm that is correct, Mark, and we are chasing the approvals. Thank you. Uh, Health Partnerships Forum. Yeah, yeah, a couple of things, Mark, if, if, if I may. Um, meeting was a number of weeks ago, but um, we received presentations on primary care in North Wales and on the Stronger Together Work Programme. Um, I think the forum was keen just to provide some advice, uh, which is set out in, in, in the document on that. Um, particularly in terms of primary care, um, we, we were... Um, really keen to advise the importance of primary care in, um, in, in providing involvement and indeed leadership in the plan of care transformation program uh, in the health board. Uh, and we particularly referenced the, uh, the development of the diagnostic and treatment centers, I think as, as an example of where uh, they, they, uh, they're important um, in relation to the, the development of the clinical pathways and the clinical model for that particular business case. Uh, and then for the Stronger Together Work program, uh, which, was, which was well supported by, by the forum, um, we felt there were a couple of areas um, which would hopefully strengthen the, um, uh, the success of, of that program. First one was to, was to ensure that the independent contractor element of, of, of the organisation uh, were able to be involved and, and their voice was able to come through. Uh, and then secondly, that um, there was an attempt really in, in the presentation to the workforce about, about the programme that uh, there was some clarity in relation to what was different this time as opposed to previous engagement uh, uh, attempts um, uh, uh, over, over the years, and that um, we had a process whereby some issues that people will raise um, were, were, were were able to be dealt with, um, perhaps more short term, as opposed to uh, the thematic analysis that would come through this work that would then inform longer term uh, design uh, within the organisation. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. So, so I'm sure that all of that has been noted, uh, particularly by the lead executive who is uh, present. So uh, we'll now move on to local partnership forum. Uh, there's a note here from, from Jan uh, and Sue, uh, neither of them are with us. Uh, there's some observations in terms of feedback for the board, particularly around Stronger Together, which I'm sure Sue will have noted. Uh, and as reference to Alan, uh, undertaking a significant piece of work, which I'm sure has been noted to certainly by me. So I won't dwell on that report either. Uh, and we'll move off the Chair's Assurance Reports. Thank you. On to uh, the uh, HIW annual report. Jill, and I think we've just been joined by HIW. It's shown as with you, Jill. Are you introducing it? Uh, and moving on to Catherine. 
Um, yes, I will hand straight over to Catherine, actually, as she as she presents her annual findings, both across Wales and more locally. So thank you, Catherine, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jill. Um, really appreciate it. Um, the only problem I'm having, Kate, is that it says that the host has disabled screen sharing. So that might be a bit of a problem. I have sent the presentation over um, ahead of time, so I'm not sure if Kate can share yeah. that. Okay, I have got it loaded. I'll share it now if you want to just Thank start you. presenting, Catherine. No worries. Okay, so um, I'm Catherine Williams, um, and I've recently become a sort of temporary relationship manager for BCUHB. Um, so having having a nice time getting to know Jill and and Matt and all the people we engage with on a regular basis. Um, I'm also the Assistant Director of Quality and Clinical Advice over at HIW um, and I've come along as Jill said just to sort of trot through our annual findings um, so hopefully nothing new to you um, as they would have been through our reports throughout the year um, but just to give you a bit of Wales context as well. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction, uh, talk you through our adapted approach, um, go through a little bit of the Wales background and context, um, then a bit of work, a bit of work around BCU, what we've done in BCU, um, and also some of those key themes and findings as well. So. From our perspective, as you know, we're the Independent Inspectorate of Regulator and Regulator of Healthcare in Wales. Um, our main purpose and our goal is to check and ensure that people in Wales are receiving good quality healthcare. Um, and as you will already be aware, our main values are to be independent, objective, caring, collaborative and authoritative. Um, so there's a number of ways that we um, attempt to provide assurance um, and that can be through our intelligence, our inspection programme um, and also a big part of our role is promoting improvement um, and, and really helping um, healthcare providers get to that place of improvement. And finally, we do have a, a quite a significant role in influencing the policy and standards around um, healthcare uh, in Wales. So obviously the last uh, year and a half, I don't need to tell you, has been um, different uh, and incredibly challenging for the health service as a whole. Um, in response to that, uh, we took an adapted approach uh, very early on and decided not to undertake um, routine on-site inspections. Um, and the main reason for that was uh, because we were in a pandemic, but also around that huge pressure that was being felt within uh, particularly the NHS uh, sector of healthcare and how our presence may uh, contribute to that pressure. Um, so that was a decision we took early last year um, and that was reviewed uh, quite frequently. So whilst we didn't um, undertake routine on-site inspections, we did maintain oversight and we did that through working with partners like Welsh Government, uh, the Community Health Councils and other stakeholders. Um, and that formed part of our ongoing review of information and intelligence. Some of that led to um, on-site activity. Uh, so where we needed to have a look at something on-site, we have done that. Uh, where the risk has indicated we needed to do that. Um, we've also been involved in the scenario scenario modelling uh, with Welsh Government and also liaised very closely with Public Health Wales uh, on their surveillance information and also to gain their advice on when would be the right time for us um, to go back into doing routine inspections and also putting those safeguards in place if we needed to go in when uh, COVID was in uh, high public circulation. We looked at um, <clears throat> some new ways of working to check on care. So we did it through um, discharging our, our normal statutory functions, and that included sort of remote interviews, adapting some of the internal ways that we worked. Um, the approach that we took was very flexible. We introduced uh, quality checks, which you will be aware of, which were, were a remote way of us being able to um, dip in, check the quality of services, provide um, some level of information to you as a board um, and also some assurance to the public. Um, the main purpose of that, again, was to reduce that burden on the system uh, when you were under significant pressure and they've been generally quite well received during that time. There's also been the consideration of safety of our own staff. Um, so we've taken uh, a number of measures to make sure that our staff are protected um, when they're going out to do any on-site activity. 
So um, when we looked at our quality checks, uh, I know you and BCU have had uh, a number of quality checks now. So they've been conducted entirely off site um, and there's been a bit of a blended approach. There is our standard quality check where we've just been doing a remote interview. It's an hour's call looking at some information we've had back. And then in some more complex settings, we've had things like record reviews and further interviews with staff if we needed to. Um, and the design of those quality check, um, that whole process was to align to the key areas set out in the NHS Wales uh, planning framework framework. So what we looked at specifically was infection control, um, prevention, governance, um, particularly around staffing and how that was managed and the environment um, of where the care was being provided. So taking into account things like social distancing and the huge impact that that had on the environment that your staff were delivering care in. Um, so we looked at these quality checks as a whole, but then we also had specific methodology for different areas. So we had a specific methodology, say, for general practice, uh, medical wards, say, to urgent care. And it explored specifically the arrangements around COVID-19 and how, um, how staff were feeling supported in that and how they were able to deliver care within that um, really difficult time. So in terms of our Wales activity, um, we didn't complete that many uh, on-site inspections last year um, due to the stoppage of our routine work. Um, so we completed 18 on-site inspections, 90 quality checks, five remote NHS follow-up um, activities, uh, five remote IRMA inspections across different uh, establishments and we handled over a thousand calls through our first point of contact service and as a result of that and through our website we dealt with 439 concerns and 36 of those were classified as urgent. Um, in terms of our on-site work, it's just a bit of a breakdown here for you. So as you can see, uh, we did eight mass, mass vaccination centres, including some in BCU, which were very positive. Uh, we did dental practices, uh, mental health settings. And then uh, you can see our follow-up work were predominantly NHS. And the field hospital quality check was a bit of an outlier um, in terms of we just did one quality check on the field hospital. And that was within BCU. Um, and then we did the majority of quality checks within NHS hospitals and GPs. So the themes that we've pulled out from across Wales um, is that we've, we found that there was a really good overall standard of care delivered across Wales, um, particularly in the face of an unprecedented um, challenge that the pandemic presented. Uh, we also found that there was a rapid response from services in adapting environments and in introducing new ways of working and delivery to make sure that those essential services continued, which was really positive to see. Um, there were a number of services that had implemented innovative, um, really forward thinking approaches to support patients' physical and mental well-being. And I know some of those um, were found within within BCU, some of those really good um, sort of examples of, of positive practice to support patients' physical and mental well-being. Um, there were a wide range of changes to infection control and prevention arrangements, and we found that generally there was a there was a very good response to those, and that the outbreaks during the second wave um, highlighted that there was still a bit of a need to look at some of those arrangements, but generally there was a very positive response to those. And and finally, on the All Wales front, and definitely uh, relevant to Betsy, having been involved in some of the activity there, staff at all levels have demonstrated absolute tireless commitment and flexibility um, <clears throat> during the, the pandemic and as, as you can imagine and as you know um, we we feel that that's really impacted on their well-being um, and it will be a task in the future for the NHS and other healthcare providers to support staff out of that but really um, showed a shining example of, of, of healthcare across Wales. So getting on to um, BCUHB uh, in that period, we did uh, two GP quality checks, three NHS uh, hospital quality checks, 
one field hospital quality check. We undertook four mental health uh, quality checks, one on-site uh, inspection, one for a mental health hospital, one dental on-site inspection and two mass vaccination centres and then three follow-up pieces of work which were conducted remotely and an IRMA inspection which was also conducted remotely. <clears throat> so our key findings around BCUHB have been where we have inspected or done any activity, we found that patients um, always told us that they felt very well treated and they felt they were treated with respect by staff and they felt the quality of the care that they received was a good standard. Um, we found that across the health board, um, as per the, the Wales findings, um, services had has you know adapted incredibly well to the challenges of COVID, and all staff um, across all activities within BCUHB showed a really strong commitment and resilience um, in the face of the pandemic and the huge challenges that that had presented to them. Um, there are still some issues of concern around mental health services within the health board, um, but um, I just wanted to say that. What I have found, certainly from being a relationship manager thus far, is that it's clear that the health board has got um, a really good commitment, a strong commitment um, to improving services. And from what we've seen, um, that approach is proactive and responses as, as concerns have emerged. Um, so while we still continue to receive um, <coughs> concerns regarding mental health, um, we're assured that the health board is doing everything it can to respond to those as those concerns emerge. Um, the other theme that we found uh, was around that sometimes action isn't always taken as a result of audits, risk assessments um, and incidents. Um, so whilst action might be planned, um, some of that action isn't always taken in the most timely way it could be. Um, and that includes things like uh, where, say, a policy has been identified as needing updating. Perhaps that's not being updated as quickly as it could. So that's something we'll continue to monitor in the coming year. Um, in terms of our hospital activities within BCUHB, um, I've highlighted three very positive and three things that may uh, need some improvement over the next year. So the positive findings are that, again, we found services adapted incredibly well to meet the challenges. Um, <clears throat> staff were dedicated, caring, compassionate in their approach. Um, particularly in environments with COVID positive patients. So, for example, the field hospital um, staff were very uh, caring um, towards those patients. Um, and we found that uh, the infection control and prevention um, arrangements that BCU had put in place were actually very good and, and flagged up as a, as a positive to, to other health boards across Wales. Some of the areas where we think some improvement could be made, again, around that action resulting from audits and risk assessments, particularly in relation to IPC and COVID, uh, do need to be followed up uh, in a more timely way. Um, <clears throat> there remains some concern over staff vacancies, uh, which links into, you know, an all Wales theme, but that was something that still came out. Um, and although there's been actions to improve patient flow and they're absolutely recognised, there are still some uh, improvements that we think could be made to those areas. In terms of mental health, um, we found that services again had adapted um, to the pandemic very well um, and particularly around the environment um, and the um, awareness of the risks that were <coughs> um, present in particularly in this patient group. Uh, we found that actually those adaptations have been taken very well with good governance. Uh, we found again that in the infection control uh, and prevention arrangements, including the dedicated areas for COVID suspected patients, um, were, were very well embedded and working well. Um, there's some other areas of improvement. Um, so the pressures of the pandemic had led to the services reconfiguring um, to meet the demand. And that had placed some challenges um, in the way, including uh, making sure that there was appropriate placements for patients, which, again, in, in the face of the pandemic is um, very difficult to do. We acknowledge that. But that, again, is something we'll be monitoring. Again, um, an issue around the policies being uh, regularly reviewed and updated and communicated to staff. Um, again, 
again, that's around the actions not being followed up in in a, in a very timely way in all cases. And again, as I talked about earlier, we are still receiving and have been receiving a number of concerns um, regarding mental health services. Now, we're following those up and we're working very closely with the patient safety team on those, um, but I thought it was worth highlighting. Um, in terms of general practice and dental activities, uh, we found, again, uh, COVID-19 arrangements and infection control um, arrangements were being implemented effectively, and the environment and access arrangements for general practice and dental had been adapted to make sure patients were safe but could still access those services. Um, one of the themes that came out that we thought maybe could improve was around some staff still required uh, infection control and prevention training and personal protective equipment training, um, which obviously during the pandemic was, was really important. Um, and also some of the audits and training information was not always easily accessible um, at the time of inspection. And there was a number of training courses which were identified as being out of date. Um, and obviously, We've given a bit of leeway of that with being in the pandemic and being under such a pressured situation. But some of the training related to things like um, life support and infection control, so key training areas. Um, around other sort of on-site inspections, so that was the remote stuff, um, we looked at uh, dental, mass vaccination centres and mental health. Um, from a good practice point of view, we found some really positive practice within the mass vaccination centre, very good arrangements um, and planning, governance around those centres um, and a, a really a really positive inspection of those centres. And again, we shared that um, those positive findings across uh, other areas of Wales and so other health boards could take note of those. Um, <clears throat> specifically around the enhanced infection control arrangements, that again was a bit of a theme all through BCUHB last year in of how well you'd responded to um, the pandemic and adapted your infection, con in infection control and prevention arrangements. And also we found that um, certainly on the on-site inspections, there were very good and effective uh, governance arrangements in place, particularly in reference to the mass vaccination centres. So some areas which could have been improved in terms of the on-site inspections. So documentation required improvements in some areas. So not always completed fully um, and, and perhaps uh, not completed with signatures, dates, etc. Um, some staff training wasn't up to date uh, due to courses not being available, which is completely understandable. But that is something we'll be monitoring going into the next year around how uh, the health board recovers those training numbers for staff. Um, and in terms of the way sometimes that uh, medication stock is disposed and um, stored and labelled uh, could have been could have been slightly better. Um, and that's it. Um, hopefully that wasn't too quick. Um, but if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to take them um, or if there's any comments on the presentation at all. OK, that was not too quick. Uh, thank you, Catherine. So any questions for anyone? Lucy. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for that, Catherine. That was that was a very helpful um, uh, presentation. Of course, we get the uh, we have re been receiving the HIW um, uh, reports at QSE committee, which I chair. Um, <clears throat> the the question I had, I suppose, was around the medical services. So we know that you know improvements have been made, but we also know that those improvements are, are still quite fragile um, and it's going to take some time uh, to, to actually get those embedded. And I, I do appreciate your um, uh, your acknowledgement in, in that area because the staff uh, are motivated now and that we've got a good leadership team in now to try and move things forward. Um, the, the, the nature of the concerns that you're still receiving, though, do they tend to be related more to um, sort of staffing issues or patient safety issues? I mean, I, I've seen your findings, but I'd be interested in your view on it. Um, I think there's a bit of a mix of concerns um, where we get themes in uh, and things we can share with the health board. We do share them um, and we work really closely with Matt uh, within the patient safety team to make sure the health board are aware of any concerns we get through as well, um, albeit if they need to be anonymised. Um, 
I don't think I can go into the detail of those being a, being a public forum, um, but certainly we engage um, very closely with Matt and the team around the themes and those concerns and <coughs> completely acknowledge, um, Lucy, that this is a journey for mental health services. Um, and, and, you know, that's why we're working so closely with the health board to keep keep an eye on that service and, you know, acknowledge that it's not it's not a it's not a 24 hour turnaround. It's more of a, a long term turnaround. Uh, thanks for that, Catherine. And yes, yes, of course, I appreciate you can't go into too, too much detail. Um, I mean, we are hoping that the Stronger Together piece will also help um, because uh, there are there's, there's a change in culture that's required with the division, um, which, which is already being done and the maturity matri matrices that have been pulled together for targeted intervention. Um, the, there is, uh, the cultural side is underpinning all of that work. So um, I, I look forward to hopefully receiving uh, more positive reports uh, from mental health, but you have also identified some positive areas as well. So um, uh, just, just to assure everyone, we, we're, we are trying to address those areas. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Catherine, uh, and thanks for giving up your time to be here and present the report. And no Joe and I look forward to seeing you again at our next liaison meeting. Lovely. Thanks for having me, Mark. Take care. Bye. Yeah, no we will. So we'll now move on to the NHS WOW staff survey uh, update, which I think is with you, Leslie, but we may have others in attendance as well. We do. Uh, we do. We've got uh, Alan Greer, who's uh, acting uh, AD for OD, and Neil Thomas, who's head of head of OT. For, so basically, I'm going to hand over to them. Um, you'll 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 just see from the the general update that it was a particularly challenging time to do a, a cross BCU staff survey, and consequently the uh, the participation rate rate participation rate was quite a bit lower than we would normally expect. But uh, as I say, Neil and Alan will explain more. Thank you, Leslie. Um, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what I'm going to do, um, Nia was the author of the report, so I'm going to let Nia take us through the report, and I'm sure board members have read it. So Nia's just going to pull out some of the, 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 the key issues and the key themes, um, and then I'm sure we'll get into a bit of a discussion. So I'll just hand over to Nia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alain. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you for the opportunity to come this afternoon and present the paper to you. So the paper provides an update on the full NHS Wales staff survey that took place in November 2020. The implementation of this survey was significantly different to previous years. Therefore, direct comparisons with the 2018 survey is not as feasible as would have been between the 2018 survey and 2016. Some of the significant differences include length of time the survey was open, so from three weeks in 2020 as opposed to eight weeks in 2018. Paper copies were not available, so it was a purely uh, electronic means of completion, but this was an open link that was sent to every member of staff, and it could be used on any device, so it could be used on a smartphone or tablet, etc. And also 21 questions as opposed to the 80 that we saw in 2018. And the method of feedback has a much bigger emphasis on team level feedback and improvements. The response rate, as Leslie has mentioned, was 18%. The national overall response rate was 20%. And some of the main themes which are positive are around the engagement, experience of work and bullying, harassment and abuse, and some of the key areas for development and impactful change are around how the organisation takes action in terms of bullying and harassment and abuse, staff being involved in discussions and decisions on changes that happen within the department or team, and also teams taking time out to reflect and learn. So the actions taken to date to support the key areas for impactful change include the review of raising concerns, the new working confidence platform has been launched, and there is an established multidisciplinary team that meets to discuss the concerns raised, and also the Speak Out Safely Guardian interviews are being held tomorrow. Known in Dodd my nerves, so Stronger Together, I'm sure you're aware of, this is a key organisational development and system review, which seeks to engage with, in the region of 1,800 staff, which would be 10% of the organisation. 
and their voice throughout the three stages of discovery, design and delivery will be crucial, especially the element of continuous feedback and staff being able to see how their feedback has been taken through to the design and delivery phases of the work and how we reflect and learn from the feedback that they give us. The team level developments that we've been working on also includes the Be Proud Pioneer programme, of which there are 14 teams currently on programme and 44 have been through that programme in total. So that is all about looking at the staff engagement behaviours and feelings that staff have towards the team and the wider organisation and making improvements based on those um, uh, surveys that they do locally within the team. We've also got a new matrons programme that's been launched in April this year, and we currently have 13 matrons. And that's all about developing those matrons and the skills in terms of people management and higher level leadership skills to engage with staff. Some of the online engagement tools that have been developed recently and that we're using in the organisation now that we've moved to more of a virtual platform platform for our day-to-day -day work has been um, to support the staff feedback. Those are being shared widely with the organisation and we've recently done a demonstration to the Safe Clean Care Harm Free Steering Group and they found those tools extremely effective in terms of gaining staff feedback and how we can then report that feedback back in terms of what actions have been taken as a result. There's also the development of the organisational and leadership strategy for 2022-25 that will also review the feedback provided via Stronger Together, the Be Proud surveys and also the National Staff Survey. In moving forward, some of the key focus areas will be increasing participation in future surveys and making use of Pulse surveys that is available on the ClearSight platform. So looking at which areas need support with feedback, which areas need support with improvement and targeting some of the Pulse surveys to those services. And also strengthening the team level improvements and ownership of the feedback at the local level through established meetings such as the integrated workforce improvements groups that each division have. So Ellen, I'm not sure if you want to um, say anything in addition. No, only I, I think you've covered well the, 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 the different approach to the national survey last November. And of course, last November, we were just heading into the, uh, um, unfortunately, the sec uh, second wave of COVID. So the approach was different, the number of questions were different, the timeline, you know, the time to respond. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I, I think the I think the key thing is that emphasis on um, going forward, that national and indeed pulse surveys are more about teams yeah. and having team results and managers working with staff to co-create improvement plans and being able to measure pre and post. Um, and that seemed, that will be the, the theme, the theme going on. Um, and I think one of the things, of course, if we are encouraging, and indeed we will be encouraging greater levels of participation, I think it helps if, if, if to, to encourage staff to get involved if they see that they're, in, they're, they're, they're involved in development of plans and they're involved in measuring improvements and have that voice, they are probably therefore more likely to participate in future in national surveys so that we can keep that monitoring and indeed in pulse surveys as well. Um, so I, th I, th I think that's one of the key learn le um, learning from national survey from last year. And I think is it uh, September, October this year where the next national survey is planned and um, we have a rep on that, the national group designing that and implementing it. Um, I think the, the other thing I would add is the importance of the new integrated workforce groups that are divisional, and they were set up between the survey in 2018 and uh, 2020. There was an internal audit review um, of national staff survey results as well. And one of the recommendations from that um, was the establishment of those, those divisional groups. Um, so that they, that's a key forum for the next survey to do, and any public service to do to engage those seniors in making sure that line managers and staff are fully engaged. Okay, thanks to all three of you. So uh, before I open it up, I'm conscious this has been to SPPH a couple of times. Lynn, is there anything you wanted to, to say as chair of SPPH? Um, 
we we went through it in quite in quite some detail. We were concerned over the fact that it couldn't be compared and contrasted to previous reports, and we and we did question why that was the case. We're very much um, in favour of being team based. And if I just pick up on something that Alan said, the audit report actually gave limited assurance. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So the lessons that we need to be learned on, on, on team working really, really do have to be implemented and they need to be implemented by each area of work. And that will, I imagine, be checked up again by the audit committee. We also um, appreciate how it will fit in with Stronger Together and it should all tie together. Absolutely. And we welcome to the reports. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Any further questions or observations? Lucy. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for that. And, and um, first of all, before I actually go to, to my observation, um, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm really hopeful that the Stronger Together which is a significant piece of work uh, and um, I, I don't envy the team actually that are, that are conducting it and pulling together all of the information that they've gathered because I believe it is absolutely phenomenal um, but, but it, it, that should provide us with a really good baseline going, going forwards as to how we can what, what we need to address and how we need to address it across the organisation um, but of course that isn't just the, that's not on the back of the staff survey that's, that's been undertaken as part of a wider organisational development piece. Um, and, and I'm also hoping that the, um, the new Speaking Out Safe, Speak Out Safe Guardian uh, post is also going to be really helpful. Um, I'm glad you've, you've commented that um, we're, we're going to be interviewing tomorrow um, for that. My, when I read through this report, though, um, one of my biggest concerns, actually, is the, um, the question about if a friend or relative needed treatment, I'd be happy with the standard of care provided by my organisation. Now, that's that's um, a pretty low score and, and really does concern me. Now, the, the things that you've laid out in how we're responding to, uh, you know, the, the different initiatives that, that we're doing aren't actually in response to the survey results themselves. They were being done anyway. So my question is, what what, what is actually being done um, to respond to this, and particularly that that element? Because I appreciate that comes under patient safety, which of course we are focusing on in in QSE committee. Um, but if this is about staff perception as much as it is actually about the standard of care being being provided. Um, thank you, Lucy. I think some of the some of the actions um, that we've outlined. So the Be Proud Pioneer Program, the Matron Program, have started since the relaunched the the, the Be Proud um, and South Mission Program sort of this year. Um, but in terms of your particular point around the the the, the, the friends and family requests, um, in terms of having those discussions locally about what do, what does that mean? What do we need to do? How do we need to improve that? That would be part of those kind of team based discussions. And um, so, and, and of course, the teams will have their own reports back on, if you like, their scores for 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 all of the questions for that one. So, what is it we need to do as a team? How are we getting feedback? How are we using that? Um, and it may well be a very useful use of the quarterly pulse surveys. So if there's a particular theme such as that or another, that we actually run those over a period of time to see, so rather than wait for a next national survey, for example, for 12 months, that we do it quarterly on key themes um, with our co-created improvement plan and saying, is this making a difference? Um, so, And also, Ellen, just to add to that, that is um, a key part of the Be Proud Pioneer programme as well. So that question is within that team level working as well. So we are able to track with those teams how that score is improving over time as well. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Okay. Linda, I think you've got a question. Um, can I ask, Neil? 
I know it's always challenging to understand better what staff feel and what they feel about their work, but 80%, over 80% of staff haven't taken part. And I accept this is across Wales as a whole, um, very common. But how will we tackle what the 80% believe? One thing is to increase the numbers. About 20% are happy to take part. But do you have any ideas what causes the 80% who don't take part not to take part? Just so that we understand that. And unless we understand that, we can't increase the numbers. Unless we understand what the difficulties are. Do we understand? Do we know what the difficulties are? Thank you, Linda. It is extremely challenging to get staff to complete the survey. What we find is that the feedback that people get after the survey so we're trying to say we have listened this is what we've done after you've told us so mewn in dod mae'n erth o unity together is key to how we'll be understanding how we'll be learning how we will keep in touch with staff and how we include their staff in the developments and improvements that we put in place as we move forward as an organization. So it is always challenging. I think the timing was particularly challenging this time. It was just before the second wave of the pandemic. And we did go around hospitals with iPads to help staff to fill them in. And although it's only 12% who use the paper version, in the 2018 survey, that option wasn't available on this occasion. So I think that could have been a bit of a hurdle, but we were trying to tell staff what you can do on your phone, you can do it on your iPads, it's only 20 questions. So we did go around during lunch break to say, look, we have these methods to undertake the survey. Please help us because we do want to listen. And it is always challenging and we're always trying to think of different ways of getting staff to take part, accepting that wholeheartedly. And I sympathise. But I do think it is important that we do look at this as a whole because we're taking the 20 percent as everyone and unless we understand what the feelings of the other 80 percent are it's possible that any plans that we have in place aren't based on the accurate information but yes accepting that it's not easy at all Okay, thank you. Final question from me then. So in response to the last national survey, we put in, as I understand it, quite an infrastructure around the divisions and the expectation that they would develop their own action plans, respond to them, and they would be uh, monitored. Of course, this details further measures to inform the response to this survey and future surveys. So to, to what extent are you very content that those mechanisms are going to do uh, what you know you seek from them uh, and also uh, to what extent are you satisfied that the progress against the improvement plans that are referred to in the report are going to be uh, sufficiently monitored to uh, ensure and enable progress moving forward who wants to respond I, if, I, if I pick that up, so the, the, the staff survey and improvement plans are a 
standing item, agenda item on the um, the respective divisional uh, workforce groups. Um, and then in terms of us as kind of monitoring, so we're party to that, we're members of that. Um, there's probably some learning between, between the different groups um, to be shared in terms of you know, what enables improvement. Are there any barriers to improvement? How can we make those better? Um, so the, the key vehicle is and should be those integrated workforce groups because they're divisional, they have the seniors there, um, they are the, 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 the kind of, if you like, the primary group through which right. Okay. Where are your improvement plans? Where are your measures of improvement? How do you know? What, what's your evidence for that? How can we help you with that? Any barriers that you're having? How can we cross share between the divisions? Because there'll be some there'll be some common barriers and there'll be some different ones and there'll be, you know, um some really good areas of good practice. So how do we spread that mm -hmm. through those groups? Oh, we're also as well, um, just to add to that, Ellen, we're, we're putting this on the agenda for all of our, our leadership and management development programmes. So we are asking all the leaders that come through the programmes, how are they dealing with staff survey, staff engagement, staff feedback, and how are they taking those improvements forward? And we're also helping them with that development. So you are content that the mechanisms being put in place for enable the organisation to focus on areas to, by which to improve uh, and also enable progress to be monitored, yeah? Yes, I would say, yeah. Uh, it, it's an area we need to keep working on and, and if, that doesn't, if that doesn't bear fruit, then we'll need to revisit what mechanisms we've got in place. Okay, so can you keep, as Lynn requested, SPPH committee seems to be PPH committee uh, kept up to date, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, so I'll, I'll draw a close there. Thanks for uh, giving up your time to be with us. It's clearly a very, very important piece of work that we're concerned to ensure that the concerns of our staff are understood uh, and responded to and that they feel proud to work with us and for us. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie, too. So I'll move us on again, uh, if I may, uh, just when I get there. So we're now on to the Corporate Risk Register, which is with you, Jill. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I am going to take uh, the paper as read. If people have, um, it has been through varying committees. I think the point I would like to um, raise is is that the QSC approved two risks uh, for inclusion in the CRR Tier One, which is pointed out in the report. And um, again, uh, uh, the Digital Committee uh, did similarly. They are included within the report for recommendation. Um, happy to take any questions. There's an awful lot of work going on in the report of, that has just been completed. So just to, to let people know that, that you will see this in a slightly different format um, from next month. And that's particularly regarding um, how we are, um, how we're, um, how we're going to be presenting the risks and their journey for improvement or reduction or otherwise. Okay, thanks, Jill. So are there any observations or questions for anyone? Lucy. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so we've had some ups and downs with this report coming to QSE committee, but um, I just wanted to clarify for, for the record that um, once we did approve the reduction in the target risk scores that are, are um, uh, mentioned there in the report, it was on the basis that whilst the risk lead had started working through the actions, um, that, that had enabled them to appreciate that they could actually achieve a lower target risk score. Um, and the reason I just wanted to clarify that is because the recommendation made to the committee uh, what didn't actually match that narrative so it was it was more that the um uh we were told the the report actually said that the target risk score was being reduced because of the, the actions have been completed so i just wanted to clarify clarify that for the record so that it's it's absolutely clear on the basis in which we reduce that target risk scores 
Thank you, Lucy. And and just to support that um, comment, as, as I said, there's a, going to be a different presentation of this moving forward. Uh, and a lot of that was in response back to the committee challenges that we've had. Um, and I think that was really helpful, Lucy, in just in terms of uh, language. The other point um, we have made clear that um, that uh, any changes in risks um, will not be accepted without the full ability to be able to challenge the risk owner um, so that, that we've got that confirm and challenge that we are confident that the actions that are taking place are actually impacting reduction of the risk. So it's not just, as Lucy said, that the actions have taken place, but they are actually having an impact and that can be evidence. And clearly, uh, the conversation is continuing about risk appetite, which is clearly a board conversation taking place. Okay, right. Thanks both. So, uh, Jill, we are asked to note and receive the report, uh, which we do uh, to review it. As you say, it's been reviewed in a number of places. So, uh, on that basis, we, uh, we support the recommendation. So I'll move us on now to uh, decision items. And the first is the board assurance framework, Lucy. Sorry, Louise. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, before you is the current um, cut of the board assurance framework. It's presented to the board here today for its six monthly review piece. Um, this is the first six monthly review since the board approved the board assurance framework in its current guise, which was back in January. Um, and we have 22 risks on the board assurance framework at this time. Um, all have been subject to um, bi-monthly review um, across committees, subject to the appropriate cut across the committee. And there's been some really, really helpful check and challenge um, discussions there, which have been really helpful in terms of the ongoing development of the board assurance framework. Um, and also the growing maturity of the risk management group and also conversations at the audit committee workshop have really helped with the ongoing um, refinement and development of the BAF. Um, colleagues will note that the BAF is currently mapped across to our annual plan priorities um, and enablers where appropriate. This is almost a, a sort of interim position for us at the moment until we conclude the refresh of the living, healthier, staying well strategy, which will give us an opportunity to relook at the BAF risks refine them down, really give them a strategic focus. So we're absolutely confident as a board that the board assurance framework is a tool for us to monitor the, the risks against our uh, high level objectives. So we'll be able to get, move into that work towards the autumn time when that strategy refresh concludes. That again, will give us an ability to refine the current number of BAF risks, which through the committees, we're, we're having discussions about some of those and their more operational nature. So we'll have the opportunity to do that. Um, so I'll leave that there in terms of the process. I know my exact colleagues will pick up um, as comments on individual BAF risks as the risk owners, but happy to take any comments on the process. Thank you. Sorry, Doug, Louise, any questions or comments from anyone? John. Uh, thanks, Mark. It was really just a, a point of thank you for uh, for Dawn and yourself, Louise, in terms of uh, I can see some of the feedback I provided around the key field guidance, for instance, has been incorporated. And I think it reads in a much better way and uh, is, is, gives us the clarity we need in terms of the definitions of what, we, what we've got in the BAF. Um, I think there are some cons, comments that have been picked, I picked up elsewhere in terms of are we being too specific in some of the BAF risks that they are not generic enough? I think estates is, comes comes to mind, um, but I think that we can pick that up potentially through committee structure. Thank, thank you, John. Thanks to John and Lucy. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I echo John's comments actually in relation to the, the, the BAF itself. I think, you know, we know it's a work in progress, but we can see that uh, how it's developing um, at the time. Um, I'm sorry, Louise, I, do you, are we covering questions now in relation to any of the specific ones or are you going to take, we're covering those now? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so just wanted to say, first of all, the, um, the BAF, um, 
2112 regarding security services. Of course, we we picked this up at QSE, and, and I know we, we recognise at the time that changes wouldn't be made um, in time for for the board um, today, and that you're going to be doing a deep dive, I think, um, in, is it September for security services, but for noting for all members that um, we've asked for it to be reviewed, the risk score itself to be reviewed in the context of other risks, because it seems quite a high risk score. Um, the other thing, um, I wasn't clear about um, uh, the estate risk, that I know John's just mentioned. Um, it, it, it talks about, um, it, as, as John's just kind of alluded to, it's, it's a very, very specific risk. Um, and I wonder why that's, why it's scoring the way it is. But for me, I think that we have got a strategic risk in relation to our estates, but it's not specific to, um, you know, whether or not we are responding relating to changes in working practices. Uh, now, I know we don't have an estate risk on the corporate risk register either, but this seems to be a very high risk that we're carrying at the moment. And, of course, we've had a number of um, uh, individual estate issues that have happened in the last 12 months that have caused considerable disruption uh, to patient services. Um, so without it being on the corporate risk register, I would have thought it would need to be on the BAF because actually it is a key strategic risk. Um, but it's not the risk that is worded there, and I, I would have expected to be it to be at a much higher scoring level, given given the risks we're carrying. Louise, did you want to respond? Uh, can can do, and Mark may want to comment as as well as the risk going out. I mean, I guess from my perspective, I think there is more we can do around um, the, the sort of overarching risks uh, as they're den uh, denoted on the BAF around estates. I think there are some opportunities there to kind of bring those together a little bit um, and actually give us a, a, a risk that's probably more reflective of some of the issues that you've mentioned there, Lucy. So I think there is some, some opportunity to do that. And we have, in, in a past risk management group, opened that discussion. So I think there is more we can take forward on that. But Mark will want to comment. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Liz. You know, I accept that. I think that is, I think that is a, a wording that, that we could look at. I think we cite agile working as, as an example, and that's actually an opportunity for us uh, in the post-pandemic world to potentially look to rationalise uh, our our accommodation and the size of our estate. Um, yeah, estates does speak in a few places, doesn't it? So I'd be happy to take that away and uh, work on that with with, with the support from from Louise and her team. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think that would be helpful because I, whilst I, I think the agile working side of it is more of an opportunity than it is a strategic risk, whereas the issue that we've got with our estates across the board is very much a strategic risk that we're carrying. Thanks very much. Uh, happy to assist as well if you know if that would just help. In terms of security, we discussed that earlier, Louise, under the health and safety update, didn't we? Uh, in terms of the business case, you know, any review of the risk will need to take account of what happens to that business case. So we may as well wait to see what happens with that first, I think. Yeah, that's fine. And, and we do have, as I think has been mentioned, a deep dive on that particular bath risk at the next RMG in, in August. Okay, all right. That's helpful too. Thank you. John? Thanks, Mark. Uh, it was just on that point with regard to the security one. Lucy had reminded me. Um, because because we don't see this risk at DIGC, but I brought that to the board's attention in terms of the CCTV side. And whilst there's a business policy, a business case going through, do we need to make sure that the review is taking account of those issues that have been raised raised through DIGC in terms of the use of CCTV and the the potential risk against uh, breach of legislation and things. I did actually note that in my pad here, as you mentioned that earlier, John, in terms of the, the, the feed through into the next um, review of that particular BAF risk, because I, I agree, I think that that does need to be reflected and then considered in the round. So yeah, we will have that one as a, as a takeaway. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so we ought to uh, again note, Louise, the uh, positive observations that were made by John and Louise and Lucy about progress. So, so thank you for that. Uh, and we will do what you've asked us to do, and that is to uh, receive and note the report. Uh, a, a couple of things have been identified that I'm sure you'll respond to. Uh, and so without further ado, we'll close that item there. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now at uh, a lunch break. Uh, 20 minutes was allowed previously in the agenda, so I intend to stick to that, if you don't mind. It's one o'clock, so can we reconvene at 20 past, please? The upper now. See you in a moment. Thank you.
Okay, uh, it's 20 past one. Shall we get going again, please? And the uh, next item is the updated Health Board Risk Management Strategy and Policy, which is shown as with you, Jill. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, indeed, it is with me, but I believe we've got Simon Evans Evans in here to take us through the, the changes that have been made, if, if I may hand over to him. Of course, yeah. Simon? Um, thank you, Jill. So the um, revised risk management strategy has been through the um, audit committee. It is um, revised and tweaked uh, and nuanced rather than um, a, a fundamental review. Um, broadly, I suppose, uh, as, as covered in the, in, in the uh, paper, we've made some adjustments to the um, uh, risk appetite framework. Um, the main one of, of, of those is to um, have in place uh, a pre-agreed uh, a, a, a changed risk appetite for exceptional circumstances, which uh, should we have, um, as, as we've had in the past 18 months, uh, a, a significant uh, impact on the health board to have to go into goal command, uh, we can have a, a, a revised risk management framework, um, put a revised risk appetite statement put in place, um, rather than having to do that at, at the time. Um, we've uh, tried to make it clearer in terms of the horizontal collaboration um, across BCU uh, and greater emphasis there on uh, divisions and directorates uh, talking it, talking to each other rather than relying on the uh, risk management group to um, collate risks uh, for escalation, uh, which we think will, will strengthen the strategy. And uh, we put in clarification of the risk escalation process, um, particularly around um, board ownership uh, and, 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 and board having the, uh, or board committees having the ownership of accepting uh, or de-escalating risks onto, um, uh, onto tier one, because uh, as you'll recall in the uh, original strategy that was agreed 18 months ago, that was, um, that was the intention, but it, was, uh, it, it said slightly different things in different parts of the strategy. So I think those are the key elements that I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, highlight for you. Simon, right. so, and it has been through audit committee when Medwin referred to that as chair assurance report earlier on. So uh, that being noted, are there any observations, questions? John. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks. Only one small minor one, which is on the cover sheet um, in the risk analysis bit. Um, it talks about controls um, such as number two, the risk management training program in place and being delivered. And Somebody might see this as semantics, but for me, that's not a control yet because it hasn't actually been delivered. If if you think of an analogy with a car, if you have one lesson and you go and drive a car, you're not really in control of it yet, are you? You're only in control of it once you've had all the lessons and you pass the test. So it just feels like, are we being clear enough in terms of what really is a control? Um, and if we're... If, to control things, we are going to train people, then either all the training has to be delivered or we have to be clear about what's the 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 the, the body of training that has to be delivered before we, we feel it's effective an effective control. And the effectiveness of, the, of, of, of this control will develop over time as more people come in and, 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 and we can um, uh, uh, we can ascertain the effectiveness of the I mean, I get, I, I get, I get your point, but at some point, it does become a control that we've trained, you know, a thousand members of staff, yeah. etc., et into this. So, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's um, uh, fluid and dynamic in, term, in terms of a control, isn't it? In terms of the effectiveness of it as a control. Okay, I suppose I'm, I'm reaching for something that's more definitive that says it's a, it's a control when we reach this body of delivered training. It's one example. That's the only. That's the only observation I have at the moment. No, it's a fair point. Okay, thanks, John. Any other observations or questions? I have no hands showing. Uh, I don't have anything. So uh, that comment having been made, uh, we're asked to ratify the revised risk management strategy and policy. Uh, uh, it having been for audit committee. Are you uh, happy to ratify? Yes. 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 Good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Right, Mark, we now come to the annual plan for 21-22. This, like the last document, has been to a variety of 
destinations en route. So uh, over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. So, from a board perspective, we we approved a, a draft plan uh, back in back in March, um, in line with Welsh government expectations. At the end of June, we then submitted um, a refreshed a refreshed plan, uh, and this is that plan, and it's presented here to the board uh, for approval. We've not had any feedback from Welsh Government since we submitted our plan to them. Uh, we do know that they will not be approving any health board plans this year in the way that they would do um, under, under normal circumstances. Um, so we have had some positive feedback on a draft that we shared um, in June, but nothing more formal from Welsh Government as, as yet. As you said, Mark, it's been through a number of different board and committee meetings. But I just wanted to just run through the changes that have been made since the draft plan we had at the end of March. We've obviously updated the activity uh, and, and, the, and the modelling and the, all the bed capacity, demand and capacity work more generally to reflect the actual experience that, that, that we've had um, over, uh, over the first quarter of 21-22 received additional resources for planned care recovery, just under 20 million. Those are reflected in the plan. We've now got an EQIA uh, screening assessment and also um, an assessment against the uh, socio-economic uh, duty, which was introduced from the 1st of April of this year. Um, we've attached for your uh, review uh, an executive summary um, on the basis that that will help us when we come to talk about the plan with our partners and other stakeholders. And I'm very grateful to the support that comms colleagues have provided because we do also have an easy read, more publicly oriented versions uh, that's subject to the board's support um, today. We will be able to, to use those immediately in our, in our dissemination of the plan. We've developed program uh, action plans, which are, are split into to two. First is, is a full set that we intend to use as an executive team across the organisation. And then we've got a more distilled down version of between 80 and 90. We intend to report to, to, to this board part of our monitoring of progress against the plan. Focus on getting those as, um, as smart as possible, um, with I think the caveat that not all are, are as easily measurable. Nonetheless, we've continued um, to work, work at that. Um, we have also changed the financial forecast, but I should perhaps give Sue um, the opportunity to comment on the financial aspects of the plan, which I'll do shortly. Um, yes, just to conclude my, my opening comments, if I may, um, Chairman, uh, we're, now, we're now four months into, at the end of July, we're now four months into the year uh, to which this plan um, relates. And it's less than six months um, from when we intend to bring to board uh, an approvable three-year uh, IMTP for the health board. So that is the context in which this plan is presented and uh, I'd commend it to you for your approval, obviously being supported by the executive team. Uh, so with those comments, I'll we'll just hand over to Sue H uh, to see if she wishes to add anything from a financial perspective. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Sue. Uh, thanks, Mark. From a financial perspective, the main difference between the uh, draft plan that we discussed in March and this revision that has now been submitted to Welsh Government is around the, um, the year-end position. So we've moved from a 28.3 million deficit potential to a break-even position. Uh, and this is entirely due to Welsh Government confirming that we will get funding for the impact of the non-delivered savings from last year for this year. So that is a really positive um, step for us. And it means that we are going to be able to plan for a break-even position for the second year running. So that's taken us two out of the three years required for the cumulative break-even position, So, which is really positive. And obviously, um, this is dependent upon the discussion that we've already had about the finance paper in relation to the delivery of savings this year. So. Um, that's all I'd say at this point, unless there are any questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sue. Any observations or questions? Lucy. Uh, thanks. I just firstly would like to acknowledge that, you know, the the, uh, the changes that Mark referred to um, and the, uh, the various iterations that we received, it has, you know, we, we can see the feedback that's been taken on board. Um, and I think the plan that we have for this next year is a considerable improvement on 
in previous years. Uh, so thank you for all of the effort that's been put in into that and, and Jo for her leadership on this as well. Um, just a, two points from me. The first one is we had previously discussed the fact that this the plan would be flexible, recognising um, you know that, that things may change quite rapidly, particularly as we're um, uh, case cases are starting to increase again in the community. Um, so could you just confirm that's still the case? Um, and secondly, then in relation to the action plan. I note, Mark, that you said that's going to be for use by the executive team. Could you just um, provide uh, assurance that the actions within there have been cross-referenced to the plan, um, as the link for some of these aren't, aren't immediately clear? Thanks. So, uh, so thank, thanks, Lucy. Uh, so absolutely, plans need to be flexible and dynamic. I think that's true. In any circumstance, I think it's even more true um, in the current in the current year. And the changes even from end of March to end of June really kind of speak to speak to that. I think um, I think at the end of June we did propose a process by which the by which the plan could be could be amended. Um, having secured board approval, we need a robust process to make changes uh, to the plan. But absolutely, I can give you that, that assurance that the plan needs to needs to evolve um, as we as we move um, as we move through. Um, I think on your second point, Lucy, about the alignment between the programme action plans um, and the narrative plan, uh, yes, I'm content uh, with that. It's probably difficult to say that we can't find one action that's in the plan that's not in the action plan, uh, but we have developed them in, in, in parallel, and I'm confident that there is a higher level, there is a higher level of alignment between those two things. As always, I think that, you know, the proof of this will be will be in the kind of the tasting as we kind of um, move move through. Um, Perhaps just say a little bit um, whilst I'm speaking then about about the monitoring of the plan because we intend we have we have already started uh, with my executive colleagues collating where we think we are um, at the end of July or where we think we'll be at the end of July I should say and we intend to report that to uh, I think it will be PPPH and uh, PFIG um, in 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 August so that's when we will commence the plan uh, monitoring and that will probably allow us to test the smartness of the objectives a little bit um, in action um, at that at that stage. Thanks, Mark. Hey, Linda, I think you have a question. Uh, can I just all be with what Lenny be a truck and club? Since it's this year, that will be the first time for be able to report on economic impact, socioeconomic impact. What evidence will we have? Are we confident that? the information will be collected and uh, put into the process of planning. So our compliance with the full range of equality duties, including the, so the new socioeconomic assessment, um, is monitored by what has been um, SPPH. So we've got those organisational systems and processes in place. And we've worked very closely with, with NIA and colleagues putting together this this um this initial assessment it is a new thing for us and we're all we're all learning so I, i'm sure it'll be possible i'm sure next year's can be a little bit better the assurance i would offer to to the board is i think the role of spph um as has been um in monitoring um completion of these of these um of these assessments is this something that we will be asking Welsh Government for their views about the way that we report on this? Um, I would imagine that this will form part of their uh, inspection regime and the various uh, audit and other assessments that we are that we are uh, subject to um, as a health board. So as a new duty, um, if I think about the wellbeing of future generations work, for example, which has been around for a number of years, and there are frequently uh, assessments that, that, that went their way through to the audit committee where we are required to offer evidence of our, uh, of our compliance with those expectations that are that are placed on us. Okay. There is a national uh, Build and a Healthy Wales coordination group, of which I'm co-chair and, uh, uh, and which is due to meet with the minister quite soon. Uh, wherein we're offering to coordinate the response to health inequalities across Wales. So I think as that dialogue develops and the offer is presented from that group to the Minister, and assuming she takes it up, 
there will be more information being disseminated from that group about how we respond to health inequalities across rails and also how we report on our responses to them. That's good to hear because of the new responsibility. It does something that's very, uh, very um, apparent in the Welsh government's agenda. It would be great to start on a positive note and responding to the responsibility and it's great to hear that there is so much on the cards at the moment. There is, and uh, Trace is aware of that group, and I know he's tapped into it as well, so that she can provide the executive link for the work that's going on. So, thank you. Thanks for the question. Mark, I, I've got a question myself. So, you, you've touched on the reporting, and so I think we're agreed, aren't we, that it's a bi-monthly reporting via committee to the board that you report on detail on uh, the actions uh, that are being shown as either amber or red, so not on track or there being a concern. Uh, and, and in doing so, that will free up the performance team's time to a degree, at least, to to keep an eye on the evidence around the green recorded actions in terms of progress, so as to provide some assurance to the board that those are uh, continuing to be monitored. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, exactly, yeah, that, that's exactly the case, Mark. Okay. S second thing is, Mark, there's reference in the uh, covering report to uh, a focus on accountability. Can I just check? where the executive team stand on uh, the level of assurance you're able to provide or not around the implementation of the new performance and accountability framework that we uh, 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 agreed a little while back. I'm concerned about uh, mixed messages and the potential that it's not currently consistently and coherently in place. What's your view? I'll comment on that and I'll perhaps invite Jill to comment. Uh, Jill chairs the performance uh, oversight group that's set out in the new uh, performance and accountability framework. Um, I think it's work in progress. We've got another round of executive divisional accountability meetings coming up on the 26th and 27th of July, um, I think it is, so the week after next. That's where we meet as an executive team with all, with all the divisions. We've got the agendas agreed for that. that that's already gone out. So I think we're starting to, I think we're starting to embed that. I think where we've got a little bit more work to do is that that is intended to be close to the kind of top of the triangle almost. And, and if I use secondary care as an example, uh, but, but it works for other areas as well. We we want to meet the secondary care uh, divisional team. But we, re, we rely on them having had their own internal processes where they've met with three hospital sites there are similar arrangements within primary and community services, for example. So I think from the work we've done so far and what we've observed, those arrangements uh, are not as well developed. So I do think there is a bit more work to do um, in that in, in that space. I do think we need to I do think we need to stick with an approach. It's as set out in the in the approved performance and accountability framework. Really give it a good go. Please settle in. Let people get used to it, and then we'll be in a position to, to take stock and see if we need to change our approach any. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just to support some of what Mark said, we had a good debate at the last performance oversight group about how we use um, the data to inform the questioning, but also make clear that it's aligned to the priorities. So it has been work in progress. But we're really clear that the next set of accountability reviews are aligned to the plan's priorities as opposed to other other things, um, and that we are we are gradually improving our use of data. So we're focusing the questions in the right area rather than uh, having a single script. So it is work in progress, but um, I think the process is being strengthened. And I would say the input from the other execs in in developing uh, how we how we um, reframe those questions and get the assurance, and that may include different ways of looking through the lens so on a locality basis as well as through purely a secondary care area because the interdependencies are so critical in delivering our objectives. Okay, thanks folks. So bear in mind the performance oversight group should feed into finance performance committee under the governance structure which we'll come on to in a moment. Could you agree with John that when you're likely to report uh, on a stop take against the performance of the accountability framework? I mean, there's lots um, of going on, but I, I think it'd be helpful to that to that assurance to be provided by John or to John in that committee when you're ready. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you. Thanks. 
Okay, so uh, I don't have any other hands raised or signals or questions. So uh, the board is asked to approve the plan. Uh, are colleagues happy to do that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we now move on to Teresa. Teresa, Welsh Language Standards 37 and all that goes with it. Over to you. Um, we had a discussion in November of last year to discuss standard 37, which is one of the standards for us in the health board. And at the time, we agreed to move to translate a few more papers, the items such as the standards papers for the health board. And we agreed at the time after a lengthy discussion about how we were going to achieve the standard and we decided to agree to assess the situation in six months. This is a paper that provides details after the six months, which also gives a suggestion as to how we can move forward. This is an update. It's only a brief paper. I think it's very positive to note that there haven't been any significant difficulties within the past six months. We ensured that the papers did go out on time. Thank you to everyone in the Secretary's office. We're very grateful. Saying that, the paperwork, it's the number of, it's only very few additional words that were translated it was 20,000 in addition for one meeting because the team have been looking at the papers for the board as a whole and as I understand it may if we had translated every word there were 480,000 words in the bundle so there was significant work to be done if we do go down the route of translating all of the papers that go through the health board in this meeting. It's very positive that we can meet um, at the timetable and we also want to adhere to the standards. We recognise that we would like to satisfy standard 37 as a whole. And we're still on the journey to do this. We don't have to translate every paper, but we do need to look carefully at what the needs are. I suggest that we do a little bit more for six further months with the assistance of the office of the board to ensure that we understand what the challenge ahead is, because I don't want to. I don't want to promise to the board that we do this if we can't practically do that as a team. Because this is particularly a challenge for the timetable. What we're suggesting, therefore, is that we assess in a more detail now using the template we've been discussing with the board office to ensure that we have a template looking at the requirements. And you will see that I'm asking that we look at the translation requirements in advance, that we look at the needs, what papers really do need translating, which ones are most important, and that we're proportionate, really, look at the work carefully moving forward. Is the subject of interest to the public? Is the language assessment important for the population of North Wales and the number of the papers are? Is this something for us to consider? And do we need to, do the public need to respond? So the purpose of the paper is to bring an update to you 
And we will now need to consider what more we need to do, considering that the capacity internally of the team is very stretched. They have too much work. We do send the work externally, and as you can see, there are costs that are agreed. This has worked well, but moving from 20,000 to 400,000 plus is a big ask. So I recommend to the board that we use a template as we look at the rest of the papers to see which papers do need to be translated and what the implications will be moving forward. I think that would enable us to think through carefully that to ensure that we and that there is a promise to the public in relation to the Welsh language, but moving us forward so that we improve our position in relation to standard 37, and that we continue to carry on trying to meet the standards fully. I think the paper is clear otherwise, but I'm happy to take any questions and interested in the views of the board. Welcome to the Chair. Is that Linda as the Welsh language champion? I'm going to ask you to comment next. Thank you, Chair. First of all, could I thank everyone who's been part of the process of preparing the report and all of the work and translation over the past six months as a person who does use the Welsh version? I welcome the opportunity to read these papers in Welsh, and could I also confirm that the standard is extremely high, and that is a pleasure, because sometimes you do get translations that are very difficult, but the standard is exceptionally good, very readable, and the public will appreciate this, I'm sure. Could I support the offer made by Teresa? I think it would be wise to look practically at what the needs are to improve services on a board level, but also committees. I'm very uh, happy with the proposal made to look more carefully at the needs, to come back with an offer to be able to ensure that we achieve the standard, but in a way that provides papers for everybody who wants all the papers in Welsh. Yeah, maybe on. Yeah, well, Mr. I, I support many of the comments that Linda made. We are going in the right direction, I think. The three years have now passed since we've had the notice from the Language Commission, and we could argue that we're not moving quickly enough to us with. One of the things I did recently was to look at how Alvar's health board sites and to see how we compare, and we don't compare very well there. So whilst I agree the recommendations, I suggest to um, Teresa that we should look at other health boards and how they achieve the standard and report on that as well to compare. They have less resources, apparently, but they seem to be able to cut back to the nurse at the moment. Tracy, do you want to comment? Um, Thank you, Linda and we look at the boards, and they do. We do know that they also have challenges, and we are in discussions because our head of language speaks closely, networks, and there's a network officers that work across files, and I do know that there are other challenges. So we'll 
Dios y da tan sodima un farfie tan lindo. So we'll try and analyze where we're at in relation to translation and standard policy sound. But are other areas where we also suggest that we're ahead of our country to bring that back in six months and also have a discussion in the forum and maybe an informal discussion before we bring papers to the board. Thanks, Theresa. And I met with Larry, the head of Welsh language team, on Monday for a catch up, and she certainly was supportive of the approach you described in the paper, uh, and no doubt it was co produced with her, uh, particularly to understand the practicalities of uh, translating the scale of papers that we have at the board uh, and some of the information contained in with them. So, so I think everybody has agreed that we'll go with the recommendations in the paper you know, on that basis, and, and let's see. Uh, what that analysis tells us about what we should do and what we could do moving forward uh, and understand in that regard the results implication too of taking those steps now. Uh, just as an aside Fraser, I agree with you Larry, there will be a uh, slot at the next board workshop on the 5th of August to provide further Welsh language uh, input uh, to the board members. Uh, could, could you Linda agree with Larry the best use of that time. She said that the Tuesday would only need an hour, but if we were to adjust the agenda, I'm sure we could feel more to find more time on that particular topic. And I'm keen to do so if you and Linda felt it would be helpful. I will have a word with Linda and Larry, of course. And very grateful for the opportunity and the support, of course, for this work and the paper and the board papers. Thank you. Dr. Theresa, so I will now move us on again to uh, the integrated governance framework. Uh, uh, and Simon, Jill, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact too, this, this uh, item has been for many destinations on route to here, and it's been the subject of some considerable discussion. So with that in mind, I'll hand over to you. Um, and with that in mind, I'll hand over to Simon, because I was just going to say exactly what you've just said, Mark. Okay. Simon. Okay, um, I can't turn my video on for some reason or other. I, I think it says it's been stopped. So uh, forgive my just voice. Uh, yes, this has been through a number of places. It went through the uh, through the audit committee. We had a long and good debate about the framework in the uh, board workshop. Since when some, that some of the uh, comments there have been taken on board uh, and included within um, within this uh, document that you see before you. Um, I would just stress that it's the framework and, and, and therefore there may be some minor changes uh, to, to it as we move into the implementation framework, uh, into, into the implementation phase, uh, but, but nothing I, I don't think would be uh, substantial. So I commend the report to, uh, to the board for approval. Thanks, Simon. Any observations from anyone? Lucy. Uh, thanks, Chair, and I very much welcome uh, this framework. It's been uh, it's been a long journey, hasn't it? <laughs> and um, thanks very much for all the work that's been put in by the team. Um, I'm glad as well that you've mentioned Simon that you know they'll be tweaking as we go forward because at the end of the day, although we um, may be approving this particular framework today, I mean it will. May, well, it may need to flex um, as as things start to bed in, um, and, but, but this should enable us to actually get that structure and, and stability across, across the board and improve governance. Um, I was also really pleased to see the addition of a patient story to the board agenda. Um, as you know, we've I've, I've introduced patient stories now to to go for mental health partnership board, um, QSE committee, and the mental health act committee, and it's really helpful in keeping us focused on what we're here to do, which is all about the patient um, and, and learning from their experiences. So um, I think it's a really powerful tool. Um, I'm really pleased to see that um, on, on the board agenda. I do think quality and patient safety needs a higher profile um, still as part of the cycle of business. Um, but again, I'm sure we can uh, pick that up as we go along. Um, uh, my final point then is that there are a few 
minor inconsistencies across all of the documents. Can't imagine why with the hundreds of pages to work through. Um, but they, they are not substantial to um, such that they would affect any approval today. Um, and I'm happy to pick pick that up with um, with you and John outside the meeting. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Lucy. John. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think colleagues know that I was expressing some concerns about this um, in terms of things that were missing. I recognise that after some discussion, some of those concerns have been addressed. And I, I welcome the comment as well in terms of being able to tweak this as we go forward a little bit. Because uh, although not everything that I was concerned about has been, has been dealt with, the, the more substantive issues have, have, have been covered. So happy to 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 sign up to this as it as it stands, as long as we have got that little bit of flexibility as we go forward to tweak as we learn from the process. Thank you, John. Yeah, and that that's fine. So I'm happy to proceed on that basis too. Okay. Any other questions or observations? No. Okay. So we are. Now asked to approve the uh, the government's framework and all that goes with that framework uh, as set out in the appendices. So, are board members happy to do that? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, yes. everyone. Thanks, Simon, for your work and Jill, your work on this. Uh, good place to get to important subjects. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a team team effort, and I uh, really welcome That's the nice. input of board members. Great. Thank you, Jocelyn Alyam. So we'll now move on to. Uh, the PET program business case. Do we have who we need here? Uh, Chair, I think Judith is joining and I can see Andrew Champion, is it, has joined. But I don't know which executive is going to take the paper. Right, Andrew, I, I, I'm not getting any offers. Are you able to fill the paper or not? Myself? Yeah. Yeah, there should be, um, Sean Lewis should be joining us, who's the managing director of WISC. Check that Sean's with us. So we're expecting Sean and Sarah, I've got this with Andrew. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, it... unfortunately, Sarah's um, unwell. That's why I'm attending on her behalf. So I'll, I'll be giving you uh, an overview of the, uh, the programme business case, if that's all right. Um, Andrew, it's uh, Joe Whited here. I was certainly expecting Sean uh, to join us. In fact, she and I have had a conversation about um, the um, her presenting uh, this paper at the board. Um, through you, Chair, I'll uh, just uh, see if I can find where Sean is. I've got her contact details, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> Andrew, would you feel comfortable to start us off just while I'm trying to locate Sean? By all means, yeah, I'm very happy to do so. Please, so, no problem. Uh, um, my name is Andrew Champion. I'm the Assistant Director of Evidence Evaluation at WISC, and I'm stepping in this afternoon uh, instead of uh, Dr. Sarah McAllister, who's the programme lead for the uh, PET programme business case. Um, unfortunately, she's unwell. Uh, I'm the deputy SRO for the programme, and Sean Lewis, who's the managing director of WISC, is the SRO for the programme. I'm just going to provide you with a pre brief overview of the programme business case, and, and I'm, we're happy to take questions at the end if there are any, uh, if that's okay with the chair. I think Sean's just joined us, actually. I can see her now. Okay, it is. Yeah, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly go through um, the rationale behind the programme, some of the key issues and challenges that were facing the, or currently face the Welsh Pet Service, um, how the programme business case was developed and our plans to implement the recommendations uh, within the programme. So way back now in 2018-19, a, a number of key strategic documents were published that highlighted the critical issues uh, facing imaging services across Wales, but in particular PET. Um, so we had this, we had the um, statement of intent that was published by Welsh Government, but we also had a report from ORPET, which is the All Wales Pet Advisory Group, spelling out the, um, the very stark situation that the pet service was in and continues to be in. 
In 2019, Andrew Goodall invited WISC as Commissioner of Pet in Wales to develop this programme business case, setting out the capital infrastructure requirements uh, in Wales for the next five to 10 years. And we appointed a programme manager um, uh, late in 2019 with funding from the NHS Collaborative. And in early 2020, we set up a multidisciplinary pet programme board. Uh, and this programme board reports directly into the National Imaging Strategic Programme Board. That board is, was chaired by Sean and was multidisciplinary. It had members from all the health boards and Valindra NHS Trust. Planning leads we also had representatives from each of the three pet centres across Wales. So it was highly um, a highly appropriate membership. Um, for those of you who don't know, pet, in, pet scanning is a is an imaging technique um, and is a subspecialty of nuclear medicine. It's highly technical and, and quite specialised. Uh, it's a diagnostic and staging tool primarily, mostly used in oncology, but um, increasingly now being used in other areas such as cardiology and in uh, mental health and also inflammatory disorders. Um, the advantage of PET um, is that it provides in many instances, better diagnostic accuracy than other imaging techniques. And this enables uh, clinicians to change patient management appropriately and give them um, the, mo the most appropriate treatment, thus avoiding inappropriate treatments and making more cost-effective decisions and leading to better patient outcomes. So the, image, the uh, issues facing PET back in 2020 and continue to, to face us is that uh, it's, it's pretty stark, really. We, we, we currently have 0.6 PET scanners per million population. The Royal College of Radiologists recommends one, and actually should, we should aspire to 1.5 uh, scanners per million population. We currently perform around about 40% of the scans that are carried out in NHS England, 40%. Uh, we only have one static PET service, which is in Cardiff, and that's now working beyond its recommended lifespan. It's a very aged machine. We have limited access to clinical trials, therefore, for patients. Um, we have mobile scanners in Wrexham and Swansea. These can be unreliable. Um, it's a pretty, um, it's a poorer patient experience getting to them as well. And um, they often have to be transported elsewhere throughout the week. We also know that our population in Wales is ageing and, and we know that uh, there'll be more people accessing PET in the future. Work, the workforce issues are challenging. Uh, technology is moving on rapidly, newer machines, newer radio pharmaceuticals. Uh, we also know the demand for PET will increase year on year. We estimate 20% growth in PET scans between now and 2031. But there are positives. Um, we've got a cyclotron in Cardiff, which is a great research facility for the whole of Wales to provide novel radio pharmaceuticals. Um, we've got a skilled and experienced PET workforce, which um, uh, and they're really enthusiastic about what they do. Um, we've also introduced 20 plus new indications in the last three or four years that WISC have uh, commissioned. So things are moving, uh, but not quite as well as we'd hoped. Um, so the programme business case, it was developed with rigour, extensive engagement and input from many key groups, not least the health boards from across Wales, but also from Blindra, Welsh Government, HGIW, Shared Services, Partnership, um, Imaging Academy, you know, I could go on. Um, we set up five separate task and finish groups, which are the clinical workforce, finance, R&D and radio pharmaceuticals, and they were basically the driving force behind the programme business case. We also brought in an external consultant to help us develop the economic case through a series of workshops with the programme board. And that was a really pivotal, important development. Um, and so the process of drawing up a long list of options uh, for the programme business case was developed. And this was assessed, against, uh, assessed by agreeing a series of critical success factors and agreeing the options framework. And then, and then what we did, we discounted those options that didn't meet the spending objectives and the critical success factors, uh, which left us with four shortlisted options, which are in the program business case. Each of these then went on, underwent a full economic appraisal. We looked at the costs of each of those proposals. We looked at the benefits for patients and the wider community. And we did a variety of sensitivity analyses as well to give us some sense of, uh, uh, of feeling, feeling around some of those costs. The preferred way forward the option that we agreed with the programme board was for four fixed site PET scanners across Wales by 2031. The first bit of that would be initially to replace the old scanner in Cardiff and then to replace the mobile services in North and South West Wales. The location of a fourth scanner, that will be taken at a later stage. Uh, the total cost of the programme we estimate to be £25 million uh, and this will be used to meet the spending objectives and realise hopefully the benefits for patients. 
Implementation will be phased to allow development of individual business cases as time goes on and to address any and all infrastructure issues. And one important question, obviously, is, is revenue costs and where, where will they be generated from? Clearly, this is very important. PET is a, a specialised service commissioned by WISC. We pay per scan. And we will see continued growth in demand for PET, 20% per annum per year for the next 10 years. And this, this funding stream uh, should ensure enough um, revenue to meet those needs in terms of um, infrastructure, staff, etc. cetera. Um, we've set out a clear programme structure to implement the PBC. We set up four, four, sorry, four work streams have been proposed, radio pharmaceuticals, workforce centres of excellence in procurement, and this work is now underway. And finally, the programme has been subject to a programme assessment review by Welsh Government. This is part of the scrutiny process that Welsh Government applied to all these types of um, bits of work. And we are now implementing their recommendations, and they include things such as um, benefits identification, and mapping, mapping those benefits to measurable patient outcomes, strengthening the procurement strategy and requirements, and finally establishing a programme management office capability to in order for us to run the programme. I'll stop there, and uh, hopefully I haven't gone over. And uh, happy to, I think we're happy to take questions. Before I go to questions, Sean, good to see you again. Is there anything you want to add? I just want to say we've had great engagement from your team in North Wales, um, Mark Elias, and I'm afraid your radiography manager's got name has just popped out of my head. Andrew, can you help me? David, I can't remember, unfortunately. It's, da it's David. Anyway, David we've Jones, had absolutely. David Jones. Thank you. We've had great engagement and support from them, and I just really wanted to, to mention their names. Yeah, sure. So, uh, questions. Johnny, you've got your hand up. I don't know if that was the last item or a new one. Uh, um, it, it was an old hand, but I wanted to put it up for this as well. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, the thing that just struck me, I think I think in principle I've got no problems with this at all, but it's, it's just some of the justification in terms of the background. Uh, and at the bottom of page two on the cover sheet, and I think, and it's in the main uh, business case as well, it refers to 33% of PET scans per head of population in, as a justification that scanning activity levels are low. But I don't know what it's 33% of. So, so it goes to the justification for this. Now, why, what, what is it, what's he talking about? Compared to NHS England. So is We're that 33% of the scans that we should be doing? Or is that 33% of and 67% are therefore being done by England for us? No, 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 no. So we have a much lower rate of scans per head of population compared to England. So if you're in England, you'd be much more likely to get a PET scan than if you live in Wales. And if you live in England, you're much less likely to get a PET scan than if you live elsewhere in Europe. So we, are, we have a very low level of scanning per head of population. Okay, thank you. Andy, do you want to give any more detail on that? Just, just to say that um, it's, it's a slight, slightly false picture. I mean, it, it is quite a, there is quite a difference. But in Wales, we have quite strict gatekeeping about who should access a PET scan. We have a very tight commissioning policy where the indications are very clearly defined. In England, it's, it's less so. Um, they don't have gatekeepers like we do. So there's, there's probably more referrals for PETs going on that perhaps are outside of the, the list of indications. So I think that's part of it. But also, um, they've got access to much a higher number of, of scanners. And so patient access is much, much better. Um, I think there's always been a sort of hesitancy, people living a long way from Cardiff, to travel all that way for a PET scan. And um, But now we've got uh, a unit down in Swansea. That, that's, that's pictures improving. It doesn't help people transfer it. Tra traveling from North Wales, no. Um, no, not at all. I, I, so, is, I suppose the other the other side of this for me is: is there a contribution in terms of what's needed? Is is there a difference in need within the Welsh environment to the English environment or the European environment, or is it? Would would your expectations be that the the demand should be similar? 
we would have thought the demand should be should be very similar and we know that there are areas where we're not currently scanning which patients are having scans for in England so our range of indications is lower and for those indications that are the same we've got a lower rate of scanning um, and that's as Andy said partly because of access to scanners mobile scanners are much less flexible so if you have got a mobile scanner on a Monday and a Wednesday um, if that scanner breaks down on the Wednesday you can't scan till the next week. Sometimes treatments are going to go ahead and, and clinicians will make the decision to go ahead without a scan. So, so the, not having a fixed scanner, we think significantly um, reduces accessibility to scans. And also it's more difficult for patients with mobility issues. So the mobile scanners are literally on the back of a lorry. Um, and actually, if you've got mobility issues, it's much more difficult to get you scanned than if it, we had a fixed sites facility. All right, thank you. Thanks. Mark. Thanks, John, Lucy, and then Joe. <laughs> Thanks very much. Hi again, Sean. Hi again. <laughs> You know what I'm going to ask? Uh, you, you've referred to the fact that we've got um, stricter gatekeeper functions here in Wales, and, and I appreciate that um, uh, the, the comment about um, that's partly due to access. Is is it um, is it only to do due to access, and, and how does that impact our patients? Because I, I appreciate that if we don't have access to the scanners, then there's a longer wait for patients trying to access it. But I'm trying to understand as well whether that actually impacts on the, the outcomes for patients. So outcomes is always very difficult to measure for a diagnostic test because it's much more difficult to see the direct relationship. But there's lots of indirect evidence that PET scanning improves, particularly in cancer care, most of the evidence is there, particularly in cancer care, PET scanning much more accurately stages cancers. So it's good data around that. And what that means is, for example, you don't have patients undergoing very long um, invasive surgery for, for tumours that are not going to be cured by that invasive surgery, because you've much more higher level of sensitivity for picking up the actual stage compared to other tests. So it's, it's so all the indirect, there's some direct and all the indirect and lots of indirect evidence that improves outcomes. Okay, thanks. So that that's really concerning then that we're not, you know, our patients aren't getting that, that access. And I think that's one of the really big drivers for this program. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really important uh, driver. We our patients do not get as many scans as if they lived in other parts of the UK and certainly in, in Europe. That's really yeah, that's not good at all. Um, okay, we thanks very much. Is that your question finished? Uh, yes, thanks. Okay, thanks. Joe? Sean has said much of what I was going to say, so I won't um, repeat uh, what she said, uh, save to make the observation, of course, that um, looking at the um, epidemiology and uh, population characteristics um, in North Wales, um, that adds, of course, to um, the challenges and uh, the challenges with access and opportunity um, volume of need uh, which um, the, this business case in part is designed to uh, help us resolve. Thank you. Mark can I just add two two more points one is is that there's the scope of the use of PET scanning is is, is developing significantly it's, it's now starting to be used in a, as a diagnostic test in Alzheimer's disease and um, in some inflammatory conditions of the heart so the the breadth of diseases in which it appears to be of value is growing um, and secondly one of the questions which I haven't been asked yet but we often get asked is how does this fit with workforce and uh, we know we struggle to get um, people um, in our uh, radiology departments, but we are strongly of the view that PET scanning makes a department more attractive from a workforce point of view. It improves recruitment because it's that it's it's an it's it's a very innovative um, modality, um, and I think it's important for our for the future of our um, our hospitals and services that we are able to um, that we have this modality available. Okay. Shall I just quick? Sorry, sorry Mark. Would, would I be able to quickly follow on from that, just very yeah, briefly? Yeah, you are quickly going to follow on. Yeah. So, sorry. It's been made. We've got a business case to approve or not. 
So yes, please be quick. Yeah, I will be very quick. It's just around radio pharmaceuticals and, and, and clinical trials. This will widen access for patients to clinical trials that you wouldn't have been enabled to access up to now, having um, fixed light scanners around around Wales, and also access to really novel radio pharmaceuticals can only be uh, good in terms of um, widening the, the indication list for the future. Thank you, thanks, Andrew. Thank thanks, John. So, uh, coming to the rub of it, the uh, program business case is before us. Uh, are we happy to approve the program business case? Yeah. Yes. 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 Unanimous know, support then, as far as I can tell. Sean, Andrew, thank you for your time. Thank you for the work that's gone into this. We look forward to seeing it move forward, uh, and most importantly, look forward to seeing the uh, the the availability of this modality. Uh, to our patients uh, and communities here in North Wales. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Who will? Hello. Okay, so we shall now move on to uh, uh, items for information, uh, and they are listed at five one uh, in terms of private session items uh, reported in public. So I'm now closing the business of the public meeting. Uh, the date of the next meeting uh, is the annual general meeting on the 29th of July and the next health board meeting proper on the 23rd of September. Uh, I'm now excluding the press and the public and we will move to private session. As uh, as you'll be aware, can you dial out of Zoom please and redial in uh, using Teams? Thank you.